Hello everyone, welcome to the stream. Nice to see you here again. We just completed the watch party some moments ago. Well, I don't know when exactly. I'm as always late. But yeah, I really need to eat something. <laughs> so. Turns out that this streaming stuff and talking um, consistently and so on is really exhausting. But yeah, somebody said here in chat, um, Vericate um, Diode says, are Chris minutes the equivalent to the Windows copy dialog timer? Yes, basically that. The problem is with the timer, I can only, like, all the time the timer shows is in actual seconds, while they should be me measured in Chris minutes. So every. Like, instead of equally putting the time I'm too late on the complete time I show, I, I give you, um, the, the last second on the timer has basically to take over the rest of the time I would actually need to finish. You know what I mean? But that's the reason why the timer never goes to zero. <laughs> Isn't there a command for Chris minutes? I always ask this and then wonder that the bot is not working. But yeah, nice to see you here. I'm very uh, appreciate that a lot of you are still here waiting for me all the time. But to be fair, I was like in the, I, I can't even tell you how long I was online um, in the couple of um, today, basically. Like yesterday in the evening, I was invited by the German Talking Society. We talked about some of the clips before the episodes came out. It was, I was almost three hours there. Then I prepared for the stream. Then I think, 6 a.m. or something, 5 a.m., I don't know, something like that, I started streaming for. Uh, let me look it up, chat. That was watch party for five hours, and then we did the watch party, which also was four hours, and now I'm streaming again for I don't know how long. So, yeah, I was... It was a lot of online time right now. Like, I, I streamed for, for more than 10 hours in the just the past 24 hours. It's just uh, insanity. So I'm um, sorry that I sometimes take a bit longer and so on. It just was um, really exhausting. Intrinsic time control timer. <laughs> time? We don't have time to talk about time. <laughs> timer is when... <laughs> <laughs> when Bart Simpson's clock goes backwards in school. Yeah, exactly like that. So this is a screenshot I selected. I tried to get a good focus shot with Kili Brimbor. I like the face that expression that Kili Brimbor is making there in the background. And uh, yeah, it's pretty fantastic. So now I have to set up... Oh boy, I have to set up a lot of things as always. Can I close this here? Yeah, for sure, I can close this, right? I don't need Photoshop right now. We have this. This I can close. I don't need it full screen. Let me just think for a moment. How does this work again? I have to do this. I have to remove some of the windows I have here to the second screen. The problem is always the screen stuff. But yeah, we get there in a moment, I think. Uh, let me just see that, 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 that is also on the second screen. Okay. So now I close all my windows basically, except for the time, yeah, the time I can also close. I don't need it. I need chat. I need OBS and I need um, this program here to show you what is in the show, right? So I've at least prepared the um, episode already. Uh, let me just see. Yeah, I just capture the monitor, I would say. That is usually the way to go. And here we are. Give Chris some time. No, give Chris a break. <laughs> uh, does the constant background music continue? Uh, it's all relative. Um, no, the, the, the music is now, um, I, I, it sh you should not hear the music anymore. 
in theory. Like you will only hear my me talking. I hope sound vo volume is good. It might be a bit uh, no, um, a bit white noise there, but whatever. It's all relative. We read this, but yeah. Now the time jokes um, coming out here. Do you still hear music in the background or so? Just very curious. I got my. Where's my sound program? No, there should nothing be. I have no signals anymore. Don't hear any music. Okay, awesome. Yeah, the music is now gone. I know just for the timer, I just want to have some music. Audio is fine. Awesome. No, not on your stream, on the show. Ah, okay. That you mean. Yeah, th that is true. Sometimes there's a lot of music in the show, but they compose a soundtrack for every um, episode, or it seems. Or the composer made an, um, uh, an, a sound, uh, like, a, yeah, basically every episode has its own soundtrack in a way, so they want to use a lot of music. There were some scenes where the music went out, though, a few, which then becomes become very powerful. At the time, uh, um, the stream delay is really high on YouTube. Okay, so do you think, Chad, I think at least because we know this from the other title teaser video when they revealed how the show is called, they um, waiter make this in um, ma made this. It was real, like they they actually planned this and it was all props. It was not um, CGI. Do you think this here is also not CGI? I I could imagine after uh, after they pulled uh, pulled that off. But, of course, I don't know for sure, sadly. Hmm. That is not what I want to happen. Okay, now I fixed it. But yeah, we, we see like these little things here. Pretty interesting. You could also see this like stars in the sky, the background, like you see little dots here. Maybe like a reference to the music of the of the Ainur that slowly form matter and um, basically Eru makes this manifest in the universe. Only seen the half uh, half of the first episode. Yeah, you just missed our watch party then. In my impression, it's particle effect. Yeah, definitely possible. Very curious seeing like a making off of that. Speaking of the um, composer, here we see a uh, beer McCreary. Uh, I think how how is he pronounced? Query, query. Is it an e on a uh, sound? That's a magnet board, I think. Yeah, I could imagine that as well, that they use magnets to, to get this effect off. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think that might be too. But yeah, pretty pretty nice that they do these practical effects. And I feel like a lot of stuff, like the orcs looked very practical. No comparison to the Hobbit um, CGI orcs. So some people say there's a lot of CGI and stuff. I felt like it looked, everything looked very like an ear. So it's the E sound. Also welcome Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> McCreary then, okay. Or oh, it's Creary. And the first name is pronounced like bear. I mean the second name. Or is it also beer? Now the EA in English in Eng the diphthong with E and A always confuses me in English. <laughs> but yeah, whatever. Um he made 
Like I said at the beginning, some people asked how I like the soundtrack and I said mm, something was missing. I feel like if you see the visuals to it, the soundtrack becomes better. Um, otherwise, I, just listening to it alone, I felt a bit... It was okay, but didn't blow me away, if that thing. But now, uh, if I think back uh, of it, now seeing it with the actual episodes, um, it really worked impressively well. Like the visuals definitely um synergize so well with the music in my opinion it works like i like the soundtrack some people said they found it uh, disappointing or underwhelming and i guess if you have such an iconic soundtrack compared to the lord of the rings to howard shaw's soundtrack it's it's really difficult to to get there but for me the soundtrack definitely worked so far, the first two episodes were great. Not perfect, but not terrible like most uh, new shows. Yeah, I agree with that. I expected the worst, and it turned out pretty decent. So I'm pretty uh, impressed also with some of the stuff they did. But I also have concerns and some stuff I didn't like as well. But overall, uh, pretty solid. Yeah, but um, let me just see. I have to switch scenes at times because I can't... I would just press play, but I can't do this. So you have to... Um, but you look at these shots. Like, I, I, I like them. They also move a bit. So I, I, could, I could definitely see uh, magnet stuff going on here. Like I said, I wouldn't want to get claimed, so I need to be very careful how much um, footage I show you. But it's true, the, if the soundtrack stands out too much, it might distract you or and so on. Yeah, Howard Shaw is a tough act to follow, I agree. But yeah, I think also this is this might not be CGI, it might be real. Let me zoom in a bit closer. Like if you, for example, look at this, I can totally see that you could generate this pattern with magnets. Where's my <laughs> streaming thing? There are also a lot of comments I need to answer. Currently um, occupied though. Okay. So I will often switch to this image here in case people wonder because I have to search for the next scene. So the next scene we see Galadriel in the water. So I, maybe I should just show, wait. But yeah, they have some interesting patterns going on in the background. This one also looks pretty cool, I have to admit. Yeah, it's a shame they didn't have access to the Silmarillion. I would have been uh, to fantasy Tulkas Peter Morgos. Like the school quarterback bullying <laughs> the Seattle kids of the bar. Yeah, I agree with, um, uh, I think, I. <laughs> Cinematography is epic. Um, it feels polished. You can see the artistry and effort put uh, in. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. It looks really good. So after this uh, intro here, we get to the water scenes. Like, you can watch this, like, the sand moves and so on. There's for sure some editing in between, but I could imagine that it's mostly done with practical effects. So the first scene, we see Galadriel in the water, but we also see the stars. This scene here, I will mark here on my side. 
So we can come back to this. I would like to um, compare this scene later to what to the to the um, firefly scene with a stranger because I could definitely see a connection here and there. Quite interesting, in my opinion. Um, what am I looking for? I was some. I wanted to look up something. Yeah, I wanted. Um... Hmm. Does somebody remember the star constellation name? As I would have to look in old scripts of mine. For example, there's one mentioned in the Lord of the Rings. Let me just look it up. Oh, Chad, why don't I find it? The plow, yeah, there's the, what is the elvish name of the plow? I should have maybe just searched for plow, right? I can't find it, that's strange. Was it, was it not Valakirka? That is his name. In my, in my mind, it was Kalakirka, but it was Valakirka. The sickle of the Valar. Maybe I assume that is what we are seeing here. Yeah, thank you, CPP20. Now I found it myself. <laughs> But uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. That that name I was looking for. I was uh, it was driving me nuts. How was it called? I couldn't remember. Kal um, Valakirka. 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 I think the stress is on the eye, right? On the second last. Whatever. Upside down, though. Yeah, that is true. It's upside down. It should be the other way, but. I don't know. We it's it's kind of looks fitting though. <laughs> I won't bet be until I get a 1000 hour uh, series with the entire. Yeah, just a guess. Definitely. So that's quite interesting. So under this star constellation, um, we will look later into the scene here again. We see Galadriel swimming in the water and she looks up into the sky and looks at the stars. Let me just show the scene here. Man, editing comments with my <laughs> fingers on this little phone is terrible. Yeah, I, I can see that. That's maybe true. Maybe it turns around the sky and world movement. That's definitely a thing. She's also at a very unusual place in the water, looking up into the into the sky. And yeah, she just jumped off the boat and is now in the middle of the ocean. And yeah, she looks quite small in this scene. I kind of like this shot though. There in the middle, you see um, Galadriel swimming in the water and thinking to herself, I'm screwed, kind of.
next scene, um, yeah, not much to say here. We see like some shots from underwater. I won't go through every Galadriel swimming scene. And she starts swimming into the, um, no, sun, 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 not into the sunset, but I guess she starts swimming east. Then um, the second episode also um, continues where we have seen um, the scene with uh, Nori Brandyfoot. Really interesting. And she's standing next to the crater where the meteor uh, um, just impacted. Uh, Bilbo Baggins, any good guess to um, who the stranger is? Yeah, that all speculated a lot. Yeah, the stranger's part also worries me quite a bit. My guess would be either... Like, I have multiple theories. Either it is um, a wizard... Maybe Gandalf, maybe a blue with it, maybe Radagast. I have no idea. He's or he's a new character, or he's Sauron. Or my fourth theory is, I don't know why, but maybe two like a good Maya and a evil Maya are trapped in one body and they fight over control or something like that. Like it's kind of strange that he is he's like on so far he's portrayed like a bad omen for everybody around, in a way. Like, we definitely see this when, um, like, a lot of other bad omens already happened, and uh, it also happened here. And interestingly, this this scene I de definitely want to um, discuss here a, a moment. We have, like, a later scene. Let me see if I find it really quick. Where, sh where she, like, Poppy appears, and then they um, basically... Um, uh, Nori falls down... And she lands on, on uh, down in the crater close to, like, fire on the ground. And then she pulls up her arm and says, hmm, it's, like, it's not hot. The fire is not hot for whatever reason. And I don't know. For example, remember when Frodo put the one ring into the fire and he pulled it out and gave it to Frodo and said, it's quite cool. Something like that is going on at the beginning of um, or during the season one uh, season during episode one Galadriel also when they were in this evil place where Sauron once was she said basically um, yeah my, my hands I, I, one of the elf companions says I can't I can't f I don't have any feeling in my hands anymore and she says this place is so evil that um, the light of the torch does not give any warmth so you, it is fire, but it becomes cool in the presence of Sauron. So, in a way, my biggest guess would still be on the Sauron side here, because we get very little references, bit by bit, that kind of hint at this, in my opinion. But I could be completely wrong, of course. The bad omen is not the necessary the evil itself. I agree with you there, but he definitely gives me not a completely evil impression, but kind of one. Very strange. Uh, fun fact, uh, the actors of Galadriel and Halbrand had really to train to hold their breath underwater so they could manage <laughs> those shots. That's impressive. I'm not sure how law-based the cold fire is. For sure, Sauron could also make heated fire and burn people with it. But... Um, we can read that, let me see if I find the quote in the Lord of the Rings. I know where it's, no, I don't know. Yeah, I that Strider or a knife, a knife in the Dark should be the chapter. I would go with a knife in the dark. I think Strider says this to um, to Frodo. Yeah, that is. Um, there's little shelter or defense here, but fire shall serve for both. Sauron can put fire to his evil uses. 
as he can all things, but the riders do not love it, and fear those who wield it. Fire is our friend in the wilderness, it says. No, it's just wilderness. <laughs> so here um, Strider says that Sauron is able to put fire to use, and he also, like, um, let me see if I find the other quote from the Council of Elrond. Uh, Council of Elrond. It's like a section that's written in italic letters. Uh, so I have to find that. That's the poem. Another poem. Yeah. The ring misses maybe the heat of Sauron's hand, which was black and yet burned like fire, and so Gilgalad was dis uh, Gilgalad was destroyed. It maybe um, where the gold uh, maybe where the gold made hot again, the writing could be refreshed. So there are some connections with Sauron and and fire, and. Like, I don't know, I would consider, like, let's maybe go, uh, t t take a little spoiler alarm here. For, for, I'm not sure who watches this, but little book spoiler alarm for, we talk about um, a, a character called, that later appears called Anatar. And maybe I can <clears throat> also find the quote for that. Um, let me just, I just have to prepare the, the quote. Sorry for that. I must think. Where is it? It's from Nature of Middle Earth. I just need to find it now. So, spoiler warning again. Um, for people who don't want to know, because now we got into book spoiler territory. So, for people do who are not aware, Anatar, of course, is Sauron in disguise, and we know he is there coming to Middle Earth. And he is basically, uh, multiple quotes I probably need to read here, but one is in Nature of Middle Earth, if I can find it. And there's a text in uh, Nature of Middle Earth called Note on the Delay of Gilgalad and the Numenorians. And um, there's an interesting quote about um, Sauron taking this disguise. And we know that also the um, editor from Nature of Middle Earth, Karl Hostetter, is also involved in the show. So there is definitely the possibility that they made had some that he had some also great scholars consulted them. So at some point at least, even though there are a lot of law differences, still there's also some quite a bit of correct and stuff that is goes in quite a bit of detail. So I can I can potentially see what um, they might referring to. Let me just see if I find it in the Silmarillion. Um, what was the, I know what the chapter is called, but I also know what chapter it is. No, for real. I don't find the quote. Does somebody remember? Like, there's a there's a quote from Tolkien where um, yeah, he ba basically it's described that um, that um, Sauron was basically foreshadowing the arrival of the Istari, of the ambassadors of the West. A lot of quotes I need to read here, but to to get the point across why I think what could be um, going on here.
Maybe it's in the unfinished tales and not in the Silmarillion. Yeah, I found it. I found it. It's in the... Uh, 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 you don't have... You can stop searching. I found it. So let me read from the... It's in the Unfinished Tales. And uh, there we can read... Um, in Eregion Sauron posed as an emissary of the Valar, sent by them to Middle-earth. And then, in um, Tolkien adds a comment, thus anticipating the Istari, or ordered by them to remain there to give aid to the elves. He perceived at once that Galadriel would be his chief adversary and obstacle, and he endeavoured therefore no, uh, to, therefore to placate her, bearing her scorn with outward patience and courtesy. That's a very interesting um, quote from the history of Galadriel and Celeborn, and Tolkien's idea was basically a bit with, with Sauron according to this, that he foreshadowed, that he um, how does he anticipated the arrival of the Istari? Very interesting. So he posed to be one of those wizards, those ambassadors of the West, when he came. And for that he had to take a different form, that of Anatar. And maybe that is what they are going here. Like he appears to be like everyone says, hmm, he could be Gandalf. But that's exactly what people should think. That guy could be Gandalf. But he's not Gandalf, he's Sauron then. And I feel like these little details add to this. And um, the other quote I wanted to read, I mentioned about um, the delay of Gil-galad and the Numenorians um, from nature of Middle-earth. Um, there is an interesting uh, quote as well. Just have to find it. It's a very short text. Yeah, here it is. Let me just read this. His occupation of Mordor no doubt would have uh, would, would have kept the <laughs> let's start off uh, let's start again his occupation of Mordor uh, he no doubt would have kept secret if he could and it would appear from later events that he had secured the allegiance of men that dwelt in lands adjacent even those west of Anduin in those regions were afterwards uh, in those regions where afterwards was Gondor and the Ered Nimrais and Kalinardon. But the Numenorians occupying the mouth of Anduin and the shorelands of uh, Levinin had discovered his devices and revealed them to Gil-galad. So the Numenorians were occupying the mouth of Sirio. Maybe it's map time again. So we hear a lot of place names. Let's say Sirion, um, Anduin. There's also mouses of Sirion. That is this place here, in case people wonder. We're still in a spoiler warning. Um, so this place here, are the. this is the Anduin, the river, and these are the mouths of Anduin. We know there is a later a, a Gondorian city called Pilargir, and it is founded by Numenorians in the Second Age, actually, which is a very interesting detail. And it turns out that because they settled there, They'd found out that um, Sauron is doing strange stuff there in Mordor and adjacent places, and he found out about, and they found out about his plans. Hey, I leave it here the the map for a time. So I just reread this. Um, uh, kept secret, and it would appear from later events that he had secured the allegiance of men that dwelt in lands adjacent, even those west of Anduin, in those regions were afterward, uh, I, lost the, I lost the line again, allegiance that uh, dwelt in the lands adjacent, even those west, in those regions where afterwards was Gondor, in Ered Nimrais and Kalinardon. Kalinardon is where later Gondor is. Ered Nimrais are the uh, White Mountains. That's also where, for example, the Oathbreakers are, which also had, like, um, allegiance at some point to Sauron. But the Numenorians occupying the mouth of Anduin and the shoreland of Lebinin had discovered his devices and revealed them to Gil-galad. But until Second Age 1600, so there is a time when Sauron takes this disguise, 
spoiler warning, takes this disguise as Anatar, as um, this person, um, the disguise of beneficent friend and often journeyed at will in Eriador with few attendants and so could not risk any rumor that he was gathering armies. At this time he perforce neglected the east where Morgos and ancient power had been and though his emissaries no, I scroll to John five, and now his emissaries were busy among the multiplying tribes of eastern men and dared not permit any of them to come within sight of the Numenorians or of western men. The orcs of various kind, creatures of Morgos, were to prove the most numerous and terrible of his soldiers and servants, but great hosts of them had been destroyed in the war against Morgos and uh, in the destruction of Beleriand. Some remnants had escaped to hidings in the northern parts of the Misty Mountains and the Grey Mountains and were now multiplying again. But further east there were more and stronger kinds, descendant of Morgoth's kinship, uh, kingship, but long masterless during his, uh, during his occupation of Thangorodrim, they were yet wild and ungovernable, preying upon one another and upon men, whether good or evil. But not until Mordor and the Barad-dur were ready could he allow them to come out of hiding. While the eastern orcs, now comes the important part, who had not experienced the power and terror of the Eldar, the elves, or the, the Valar of the Edain, for example, yeah, that are the, the ancestors of the Dunedain in parts, were not sub, uh, subservient to Sauron, well he was ob uh, obliged for the cozening of western men and elves to wear, now it comes, as fair a form and a count how is this pronounced countenance as he could. They despised him and laughed at him. Thus it was that though as soon as his disguise was pierced and he was recognized as an enemy, he exerted all his time and strength uh, to gathering and training armies. Uh, it took some 90 years before he felt ready to open war. And he misjudged this as we see in the final defeat when, he, uh, when the great host of Minastir from Numinor landed in Middle Earth and so on and so forth. So what basically this text that I've terribly read right now <laughs> um, just says is that Sauron's plan to travel in a disguise was in a way that he could not simply give this disguise up and go to Mordor and is he Sauron again and does stuff there. He had to stay in this disguise all the time. And at this time he also neglected the orcs and there were some servants he had and so on and so forth that um, did stuff there. But if you read this text and have in, in, in mind what we just saw in Tir Harad and so on, which is in Mordor, so this is a kind of eastern region if you want. Like if you uh, consider all of this, it definitely, you definitely see parallels to what we see depicted here in parts with, for example, the um, Tir Harad Arondir and the people living there, but also maybe with a stranger. So I still have like the very strong feeling that he might be Sauron in disguise and it's not done in a way that we completely see what is going on with, with this, but that Sauron plays the long game here and he tries to be really cunning and come over as Gandalf, but in truth he is not. But I could be completely wrong, don't get me wrong here, but the idea is definitely there in the books for details like this and I find this very interesting. Still um, I'm a bit concerned like how Anatar might present himself. But yeah, so what do you people think? <laughs> not the map boy again. <laughs> it's really a nickname I'm not a fan of, I have to admit. I mean, it's not bad, but...
Map time, yay, exactly. I'm such a map geek, yeah. Map is awesome. Shoutouts to my moderator Kirdan, who made um, who modified this map. Though the original map is of course from Amazon, but he made it more co uh, precise and correct and edited some stuff. Pretty impressive work. He also made like a second and uh, a third age and a first age map in this style. Pretty nice. A lot of work. We have to see it from when it comes to the diversity topic, um, always from this perspective that it's so far, it seems that the topic of how an elf looks, like what skin color he has, is simply not a topic inside the world itself. So it's just the actor who looks like it. I'm curious where the half-foots are on the show. Um, I think we know where the half-foots are on the show because the show blends in these maps. So we don't know it exactly, but somewhere around here. Um, in the other episode, we saw the... Um, maybe I can mark this here and then we can skip. Um, uh, then I can skip back to the... I have to admit, I'm absolutely not sure where, we f where in the show we saw the half-foots for the first time. It's after the prologue. And after Galadriel returns, I think, to the place. Might be, take, yeah, it takes a moment to find. Uh, these two dudes here, for example, maybe let me um, update my map a little bit. I can't make the map much smaller, so you have to forgive me here. Um, we move a bit further here in this direction. Uh, these two guys with the antlers talking to each other at the beginning of episode one um, talk about a lake. And I assume the lake they are talking about might... Like, there are not that many lakes in this region we know about. They could maybe talk about, I don't know, the Sea of, uh, the sea of Nurnen, or they talk about the Sea of Rune. I prefer map time or map 10. Yeah, I'm, I also prefer a map time. Map time is a good word because I don't like, I don't know what time is, but I know what maps are. <laughs> Definitely time has also always been a factor here in my streams. It's still going off. We are going again. <laughs> it's basically, now we discuss in detail episode, um, too. So yeah, these dudes mention this. So it would kind of fit if the hobbits would be, I don't know, somewhere around here in this area. So my moderator, uh, shout out to Kirdan, um, Chris time, exactly. Uh, my, my moderator um, suggested that maybe the hobbits live in um, Dorwinion, I think is the name, right? Dorwinion? Is, is an R in the word? Man, haven't read this this name in quite some time. Let's type it how I think it's written. Yeah, Dorwinion. Um, Dorwinion is mentioned um, in The Hobbit because the wine of Thranduil is coming from this region. We don't know exactly where it is, but often it's supposed to be here, kind of. And I think he, he was pretty close with this. They call it Wilderlands Rovanion. However, Rovanion ends here somewhere and then Rune starts somewhere here. So it's basically at the east border of Rovanion, pretty much very east where the hobbits are. find that quite interesting.
Near the Lonely Mountain would, um, I agree with you, near the Lonely Mountain, now I have to scroll up with the map a bit, Lonely Mountain is here for people wondering. And we were down here almost, a bit further even south. Um, also a possibility because there's um, also the Long Lake, also a possibility. But um, the the map, when the in the show, when we zoom in, um, the map definitely showed us this particular area down here. In the books I know, uh, Mayar and Valar are set to come by ship, but um, I always wondered how the Balrogs and dragons and other Maya spirits arrived may relate to a meteor. The only Maya relation to a meteor we know is a is Tilion. Like there's a poem in The Adventures of Tom Bombadil where the man in the moon, Tilion, fall, crashes down on the earth like a meteor. That's the only thing I can think of when it comes to that. How the Balrogs went away or flew away or if they could transform into a meteor, I don't know. I think it's not mentioned. They wouldn't be the first ships in the sky, that's true. But yeah, um, still, uh, if we return to where we just left off, we, like it was a huge detour with the Meteor Man stuff. And um, here we see the Meteor Man and Nori. Now I can maybe remove the spoiler warning because we discussed the Anatar stuff. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I think they did it pretty well that the, like, um, somebody in chat also wrote, Tirza, I think it was, that they also synchronized the splash into the water with the impact of the meteor. Pretty, pretty nice done. I got to go. I know I just got here. Have a good evening. Yeah, um, much fun, Rosie. Thank you for, for always joining and being a bit active. I hope you enjoyed your short time here with us. Yeah, hit the like button, everyone. Exactly. But yeah, um, the, the quote that I just read from The Nature of Middle-earth, I feel like if you can, if you, if you just read this and just recapulate what happened in the show in episode two, you can definitely see the parallels um, coming up here and there. We have the men in the east, we have the servants of Sauron who um, keep connected. We have Sauron who is busy on a different mission. That's maybe why we don't see him and so on. So I don't know what's going on there exactly. He can't just leave his disguise. He's trapped in this form here. Um, it would fit for him. I have to admit though, I c maybe s they want to implement a Gandalf in, this, in the second age already or a similar character, who knows, but I still have, like, like, somebody wrote that um, Halbrand seems like a bad guy, and somebody wrote in chat somewhere on the comments, I th no, I think I talked to um, another content creator, um, shoutouts to Hello Future Me, we also discussed this on the Discord channel um, very briefly, and he said um, that Halbrand feels so much like a bad guy, it's so it, it's it's almost too obvious and that's all this I, I totally agree with him there um that yeah how, how to phrase it it's maybe Halbrand is a bait that everybody thinks yeah that guy is Sauron and so on they play a little bit with it and this guy is Gandalf like I think they these two characters might exist to distract from making it clear who is who, if that makes sense. Because we know there must be some, at some point, a hidden Sauron somewhere. And um, yeah, I find that very, very interesting, theory-wise. And this makes it fun, of course, for us people who, knows, who know the books to also um, start guessing and develop our own theories. Like a red herring, exactly. Yeah, the book states that they um, suffered memory uh, loss. Or that, that's, I, I know what you're referencing. I'm not sure how it's phrased, though. Oh, I have to be careful with that.
Let's go with some artwork here. In the meantime, uh, let me look the... Um, uh, where could we find this? Forgo might, probably in this section. Yeah, so um, let's. There's a there's a quote of the what what the Ista, the, the wizards that were sent to Middle Earth, like Gandalf, Radagast, Saruman, and the Blue Wizards. Um, what was going on with them? So and, and I read it a million times here on stream, but it's a really good quote. For they must be mighty. Again, for they must be mighty, peers of Sauron, but must forgo might and clothe themselves in flesh so as to treat on equality and win the trust of elves and men. But this would imperil them, dimming their wisdom and knowledge. And now comes the word, and confusing them with fears, cares and wearinesses coming from the flesh. So I'm not sure if there's an explicit statement that they would lose memory or so. You might be right. Um, maybe there's, there's another section in this. I can't remember how it's phrased. But um, this already implies that they might be confused. And if we look at the stranger here, when uh, later in the, in, the, in the scenes, he uh, definitely seems also confused. Now, after he clean, uh, cleans up, he seems to be fair. Yeah, I could imagine that. Yeah, exactly. How... Um, uh, I always interpret it like this vast knowledge having to be shut down into a brain of a human uh, and and not at all not not all fits um, and, and and basically yeah, it can confuse them then as a result um aren't wizards tied to stuffs in some way so not having stuffs means maybe uh, not gandalf it's an interesting idea adam I think the stuff thing is very debatable in my opinion because for example when um let me just see the film scene where um Gandalf fights um the the Balrog in um the first film let me just see The famous scene, you shall not pass, in, uh, we see Gandalf here, with his stuff, and he smacks it on the bridge. In the books, the stuff explodes, and then Gandalf still fights with the Balrog for days and defeats him in the end, though he dies in the process as well, without the stuff, though. That always gives me the impression that Gandalf doesn't need the stuff to be powerful. It's more like a symbol for his authority. And in case then of, of Saruman, he breaks his stuff to end his mission, to um, take away from him this authority in kind of a symbolic act. Maybe it's even a bit more than just a symbolic act, but you, I hope you know what I mean. So um, the stuff is not necessary in my opinion. I think it becomes later. And as I said, um, when this is, for example, um, not Gandalf, but Anatar, um, then... The, the Istari weren't there yet and they not known as wizards. So he could like go for a different approach. It's just said that they that they that he anticipated the um arrival of the Istari, but it doesn't say he is an Istari, he just pretends to be one and they weren't there yet. So he has some like Amazon with, with the law, they have some freedom here and there. A focusing tool, some put it like this, yeah, something like that. But a very good um, point. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I think I also read this. Sauron anticipated the East study and thus came in from... Uh, and so on and so forth. If Meteor Man is Sauron, maybe this is the best guess from uh, the study would take and how they would arrive. It, it's very interesting in this aspect. Always seems like fake elf to me. Yeah, Al also a possibility.
However, um, yeah, we we come to this in a moment. Um, let me let me look up the next scene here. I think we discussed enough Meteor Man. Um, I can't tell you who he is. I like though that um, Nori um, hits touches his face or his head. Kind of funny. And I definitely think the this detail was that the fire is not hot. And we have later this um, scene from above. That's the best frame I could uh, give you right now. It almost looks like a fiery eye, so... I don't know. I think my... I can't... I'm not sure... Can I rotate my image still? I can rotate it still, I think. <laughs> oh. I'm I'm an idiot, it turns out again. Uh, transform, maybe. Well, you see it anyway, right? Oh, they added this now. Awesome. Okay, that I like about the new OBS version. I can now move it myself. I could even go to studio mode, and you can you can live rotate it now. Then awesome. It looks like an eye. Not gonna lie. So yeah, um, any um, more comments on the stranger? I think we might come back to him. We a few times more in the, in the stuff uh, in the thing, but these are all the things I could currently think of. In mind, I have yet to watch it all, so we get a lot of spoilers here. I hope you don't mind them. I think if I'm not also 100% sure, I, it's, I think it's um, yeah. Two Towers is always a book I rarely re read in the past uh, years, so I am always a bit out of Two Tower knowledge. But I think it's mentioned there. What's also interesting in this scene here is I have really trouble hitting the frame. Like he he collapses now in this scene, and then in a moment, um, the fire. Um, let me just see if I see it. Then the fire starts to um to, to the fire starts to um spread again, which I find quite interesting. I have to admit. See. Don't want to show you too many frames here because I don't want to get into trouble. But you see the point. <laughs> yeah, it it is true. Maybe it's just the character they create. Maybe he's the green wizard, which is not in the books. But um, yeah, I don't know. In theory, they have quite a bit of freedom with this because we know there are five wizards. And only three of them we know from the book that the last two wizards of the five, uh, the blue wizard, is only mentioned in sources they don't have access to. And there's also a mention that there might be more to the uh, order of the e study in the in the Silmarillion. They don't, they don't have access to that, but they could definitely make up something. I'm pretty sure that would be possible. So yeah, this happens also somewhere here in east, um, in southeast Rovanion. And then Poppy and um, Nori discuss and, and agree to help. I'm honest. Um, I would like to look up the dialogue again. 
Um, maybe I can I how, how can I do this, chat? I have an idea. If I'm smart, I have done it. I have done it. Awesome. Chris was smart in his life one time. Uh, now I have to set make the um, audio settings. Oh, I'm stupid. That's funny. Yeah, she uh, found it. And she says, uh, Poppy says to Nori, have the wheels come off your cart? Like um, somebody said already, um, um, uh, basically a proverb for the, for the, it's not the exact scene here, but um, you get the point. Um, the proverbs for fitting to the culture of the hobbits. I really like that. Like, it seems like they really put in some work um, into this. Yeah, he's colorless and breaks his stuff. I'm also pretty sure it's in the book, as you say. But thank you for um, um, Harvain for uh, clarifying that, helping us out here. But yeah, really interesting um, scene. Yeah. The, the, the Halfwoods for me are really big winners, I think, in the show because they, they really put in the effort and the actors just act this brilliantly. Like, they have a really good chemistry, I think. Some people might not like it, of course, but um, for me it worked. Also, we have seen this scene here already. This is now back in the... Um, at the se close to the settlement of the uh, Harfoots, and they have these lanterns with fireflies in them, which is an interesting idea. Yeah, the study came around um, uh, the so Gandalf, Saruman, Radagast, Radagast came um, third age, one thousand roundabout. The um, to blue with it though, according to what is it? Peoples of Middle Earth, the Five Wizards. It's in the passage um, late writings, or last writings, and there we can uh, read that the Blue Wizards came to Middle Earth already in the Second Age, close to the time when uh, Glorfindel also came to Middle Earth. However, the the Blue Wizards went into the East, which would be fitting because in a way these are, like, if we go back to the map, let's let's pretend they are somewhere here on the map. It is pretty far east already. So it is blue with the territory. Maybe it is a deliberate choice to make us think, okay, maybe it's not Gandalf, maybe it's one of the blue with it or so, for whatever reason. So I think they maybe designed this particular plot point to have so many different um, possibilities of what it might be. But we're discussing the stranger again. I would like to go on and we come back to the stranger when the stranger appears again. There is a quote like uh, for for Olorin, maybe I, just for completeness sake, I read it here if I find it in time. Uh, I know what it is. It's pretty much at the beginning. I have to just search for Olorin. It's one of the first mentions. Uh, wisest of the Mayar was Olorin. That is Gandalf. That is um, Quenya name that he has in... Numenor, uh, not Numenor, in, in uh, Valinor. He too dwelt in, now comes the point, he too dwelt in Lorien, but his ways took him often to the house of Nienna, uh, and after he learned, uh, my, I can't, it's, too, it's a bit too small, right, a moment, I'll just make it bigger. 
no no reason to to plague myself here. Yeah. He too dwelt in Lorien. This is the Lorien in on the west continent, not Los Lorien, in case people wonder. Los Lorien is named after the actual Lorien in Valinor, in on the west continent Aman. Um, but his ways took him often to the house of Nienna, and of her he learned pity and patience. Of Melian much is told in the Quenya Silmarillion, but of Olorin that tale does not speak. Uh, for he loved the elves, and now comes the important point, he walked among them unseen, or in form as one of them, and they did not know whence came their fair visions of the prompting of wisdom that he put into their hearts. So, this you can read this as an, um, from the Silmarillion um, as an implication that maybe Gandalf went to Middle-earth at times unseen, or in disguise of one of the elves and went among them. So you can make an argument for that, that he came earlier to Middle-earth, not as an Istari, though, as, so as, as a Maya who disguised himself as, yeah, who clothed himself in flesh and forgo might and so on. We, we read this quote a moment ago. Do you think the Sauron emblem is, a, is um, a map of Mordor? Since we, uh, oh, uh, since we have the map here, like this is Mordor. I don't fully see it in in this form, because um, this mountain range here goes goes more to the side, and the line in the middle of the emblem is more straight. If that makes sense. It is an interesting idea for sure. Don't get me wrong, but um, yeah, I don't. I personally don't think so. But it's a good idea. Don't maybe I, I'm wrong here. I don't know, but I think it maybe is like, uh, like if if you would close it, you could see it as an eye. So that that is my idea of it. Maybe the Sauron in the beginning of the first trailer. Maybe I see it here again. Uh, probably won't find Sard on here quick, right? Found him. Uh, Sauron has his staff here. Maybe it is his staff that is part of this symbol. It's an eye with his staff or so. I don't know. But it, it's definitely a good idea. So yeah, next is the Halffoots. So basically Nori and... Um, Poppy are stealing the lamps now and uh, and like a what is it, a cloth and so on to help the stranger out. And then we have this adorable scene here, which I really like, where they put him into an old cart and um, bring him somewhere and where he's safe and try to help him out. A jellyfish, yeah, maybe it's a jellyfish. Yeah, exactly, Robert. That's um, what you could interpret. However, this quote I just read could also mean he came to the elves in um, in Amman. Like, the elves also lived on the west continent where Gandalf was also living. And maybe he, it's because it describes um, also that in this chapter. So maybe it means that. There's another quote which you could also read like that. Forgot where it was written, though, but... Um, there are definitely some details here and there like that that would make it possible. Like in theory, I guess it's for any Istari possible to visit Middle Earth, or any, not Istari, for any Mayar possible, uh, Mayar to, to go to Middle Earth and visit it in some form. But not as Istari, if that makes sense.
Yeah, the stranger talking. But let's let's come to the stranger stuff in a moment. Um, but I really like the card scene. I have to admit, this was again it it the scene had was lighthearted, if that is the right word. Like they like it was kind of funny the scene, if that makes sense. But it was also not ridiculous. Like it it was fitting. It's definitely a more lighthearted. Somebody when we did the watch party um. Um, just recently, a few hours ago, um, somebody wrote, I think, in chat that maybe without the half-foot part, the show would become too dark. And, um, yeah, th this kind of um, worked out. Yeah, exactly. It was uh, humorous without being over the top. It was fitting. This, some people said, does it has the Lord of the Rings vibe? I felt like this particular section felt most like Lord of the Rings. Like I could, I could see Merry and Pippin pulling this off what they did there. Like they also have a very distantly similar chemistry with each other. It's not the same, but you know what I mean. Like it kind of works. That's definitely. Um, <laughs> Apart, so yeah, th this felt, this scenes, these scenes here felt very Middle Earth like. I have to admit, I liked this section a lot. Was a pretty cool scene that um, they came up uh, with here. Uh, let me just see. There was another detail I want to like. They have like this discussion when the cart is in the background and then the cart starts rolling away. Like it's also beautifully shot. Like the cinematography is uh, stunning. I really, I really like this shot. Look at that. It's beautiful. Yeah, that's a good point, um, Lady uh, Fantastic. Um, the scenes. Show uh, shows the simple but inherent kind uh, yeah, kindness of the Hobbit folk, for better or worse. Exactly, like this captures some core of that into it. I also did not expect. I was very skeptical that were that there were half foots in the show, but in the end, I, I definitely learned to like them, and I'm curious to see more of that. Of course, it doesn't have to have the same feeling, um, but it definitely was reminiscent. I felt like a lot of these scenes were kind of reminiscent of some Peter Jackson shots, but felt often different. <laughs> Poor Olorin. <laughs> It's very Hobbit-like thing to let the card roll away. It's cute. Yeah, cute is maybe also a good word for it. The scene is from a science field episode. <laughs> yeah, maybe it could be true. <laughs> that is not a bad thing. But yeah, what is all, a detail I noticed is I forgot how they phrased it, but um, they they basically discussed when they find out that we helped like a, a stranger or yeah a stranger. Um, then it's our fault. Like it seems like the culture of the Hobbit uh, here is very. Um, I'm not sure if that's the right word. I have to look it up. What it is in English, in German's aber glaube. Hmm. It's just superstition. Is it? Um, is this a right right word? I hope somebody can confirm or deny. But, but they basically what they, they believe in in bad omens and stuff happens and um yeah superstitious i guess and um yeah so they have bad omens and then poppy says something like it will be uh, they will say it's our f if everything bad happens in the next two seasons it will be our fault because they believe um uh, they believe that um due to them helping a stranger that is a bad omen and this affects the whole hobbit tribe or the half tribe negatively it's 
it's funny, George donated a cheap wheelchair with 40 brakes. Yeah, <laughs> I think I know the episode. Yeah, so yeah, they believe in these omens and in the moment she says like, I don't know, um, the fox stays too long or, and I think the last thing she says is um, a wheel gets stuck in the mud or something like this. And when she says this, the card starts moving in the background. I found this really spot on. Like it's a really nice detail that he talks about mud and then this happens basically. And then you have this funny scene. You could even put um, when the card is, ro uh, card is rolling away, um, you could put the song, um, the, the, if you remember um, the, the soundtrack, uh, the soundtrack of Howard Shaw when they are chased by Farmer Maggot and fall down the slope. There's also this specific song, forgot what it, uh, this, the track is called. You could put it down here and it would perfectly fit and would not see it any different. So that in my opinion is um, pretty cool. I, I guess the whole idea behind this part is to feel more at home for the people who maybe only have seen the Peter Jackson um, films. So they can connect to it. Well, some other parts feel very different, though often they reference Peter Jackson, but the design is much cleaner at times. And yeah, the look and feel is often very different inside the other story arcs. The Hobbits feel just far more close to the Hobbits we know from the Shire in a way, but also kind of different, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a good point. He let them free, yeah. I also want to point out how well they do the size difference here. For the most part. Yeah, then they have a talk here. They have a little, um, they build a little place for the stranger to dwell in. So he can live there and is safe and warm. It's kind of adorable in a way and also kind. It's very kind what they're doing there. I like that. It's a very positive thing. He's just a fresh East Daddy who can't control their powers. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, what what's up with the fireflies? I I haven't fully found out myself. <laughs> Fresh is study. <laughs> yeah, the next scene is also like um we see Arondia and um, Bronwyn in this shot and they like last time we have seen this destroyed village and they now looking what's going on there if there are any survivors and they notice that there are no dead people there only um, dead animals and so on it seems like the the orcs just um, captured those people from that village and we know already from the trailers where I assume they are brought to. Yeah, that's a good point, Lady Fantastic, that um, he may not have realized how easily mortal things can perish and his power overwhelmed them. Potentially too, yeah.
<laughs> His feet sticking out, that's funny, I agree. It's almost on the nose if it's uh, kind of, yeah. There are definitely these, these references where I think, okay, that seems like a Gandalf thing. So yeah, I don't know. Um, this Does somebody remember the name of the village? Something with an H. Har, he, hel, no, not Haldir is wrong. Something with an H. I forgot what it was. Um, yeah, now also I maybe should um, update my map because we're not here anymore. Now we are actually in uh, further down. We are in Mordor, in Tir Harad or surrounding. It's east, so I assume we are somewhere here. Uh, Tir Harad, uh, no, um, I think the other place is called Tir Harad, or the overall region name is that, but they named the village actually, I forgot what they named it though. Um, no, I won't find out. It's in, in episode one. Thank you. Um, Handen, Herndon or something. Uh, they pronounce it English, so I assume it's not like um, supposed to be an elvish name like Tier Harad or so. Something like this. It's uh, mentioned one time in episode one at the end. I don't want to search it for half an hour, so... There's that. We see some dead animals on the ground. Um, and they inspect the buildings. Let me see if I find a better shot of that. Yeah, here we see like an overall shot of this place. And it's like burning and burned. Very interesting. The question is, did orcs do digging a lot? I'm not sure. But yeah, we see some dead animals here. I won't show here the dead animal shots, but... And then, yeah, they notice that there is a hole in the ground. Let me just see if I can find the shot. Oh, why is it so difficult to find shots sometimes? Ah, uh, here it is. There it is, finally found it. <laughs> H something. Yeah, that's true. Could be also be Saruman, but um, very, very hard to tell. And yeah, it seems like they have tunnels and bring them somewhere. I assume they have this prisoner mining camp or whatever, um, which we know from the trailers. I assume that is where they bring the people and then, um, yeah, have to work there. We, we saw that besides Arondia in the teaser trailer, who is in these camps, that also the others are. Yeah, and Arondia then decides, like, I think this shot we have also seen in promotional material. Here we see one of these tunnels and Arondia is um, on his way getting down there. Almost. And yeah, I think this shot we have seen in the past already. His 
armor is also mostly intact. We know later there is like a big, big scratch on the armor, so he has to get it back. Hardem. Okay, thank you. Was uh, hand on was pretty close, but it was something like that. Yeah, so Hardem. Yeah. Thank you for checking out. Uh, Harving, uh, might appreciate it. So yeah, there is this village and the orcs. I'm not sure how far this, how big this tunnel can be. Almost horror genre. Yeah, it's it's really. They have some some pretty, um, pretty um spooky or creepy scenes there. In the, like going through the tunnel. Oh, we already we now switch to Eregion. but there's one scene where where um, later where um. Arondir creeps through these very narrow holes, like for all the people who have uh, claustrophobia, that's a very unpleasant thought I have, probably. Luckily, I don't have that, but um, I, I can imagine. I was like one time, there was like a cave that you could uh, what, visit, and then there was like a, a guide who showed you the cave and so on. There was like a special route where you also have to um, go through these very tiny narrow holes in, in, in the cave. Uh, I did not do the 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 extreme version of that, but um, the other version was also, um, yeah, pretty pretty interesting for one. But I I can definitely see how people get um, very frightened when they get into very narrow um, spaces and so on. So for people with claustrophobia, <laughs> for the, the the tour I already did um, was probably not uh, pleasant at all. And I have to admit, um, seeing okay, the next one is even more narrow and tiny, and um, the the holes you have to go through. So I can definitely see. Like, I would say, do I really want to do the extreme tour at one point? However, the air in the cave was really clean. When you when you are in this cave and the air is filtered due to um, the processing and so on, and the air is basically very old in this cave. And it's so fresh. And when you get outside of the cave, even though it was in a forest, um, not like a, a bit outside of a bigger city, not that much outside, but it was not like it was surrounded by by a street or so. You came out of the cave and you smelled, and it smelled like air, you smelled the air pollution instantly. Like it was that was extreme. It went away, but you just noticed how much our air, especially in in cities, smells terrible. Like full of um, uh, yeah, the exhaustion pipe things, smoke. I uh, know what 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 is it? What is it? The word in German is Abgase. <laughs> it's just fumes, exhaust gases, something like that. And yeah, it, it that was an interesting experience. I have to admit, it's, it definitely gave me, gave me the perspective of okay. Um, uh, we we definitely polluted <laughs> the air in our in our world already, but that's a different topic. Um, let us move on. The next scene we wandered from the trailer, like we get a cut and go to a completely different place, and we wondered what this place might be, and I was surprised by it. Like some people suggested that in stream, and I said no, I can't really imagine that, but it seems they were right. This is indeed. Um, Eregion, Realm of the Elven Smiths. Very interesting. Now, people talking about the orca. He looked really, let's say, interesting. Really, um, really scary s scene they um, had there uh, going on there. This now is like a complete contrast to the narrow caves, to the dead corpses of um, or do carcasses of the uh, of the animals and this burnt, uh, th th this burning village and these holes in the ground and rats and I don't know what. Now we come to a beautiful place. And it seems like this is the river that is close to um, 
a region. I would assume this is Ostinesil, the capital in Eregion. Eregion is a bigger region actually. I have to admit though, I always imagined Eregion to be bigger and looking different. But I guess I take it. Yeah, that's a good point. Could be the um, the waterfall there, Siranon, uh, right? So in case people wonder where Eregion is on the map, we of course show this. So Mordor's at the bottom right, and Ostinesil uh, is up there. So close to the Misty Mountains, close to Moria. We later see also, a, or we have seen in the last episode, a map. Oh, that is interesting. In Lord of the Rings Online, they can't call it Ostinesil. Interesting. I, I would not have expected that. I think Ostinesil is, is, is it not mentioned in Lord of the Rings? Probably not. You might be right. No, it's not. Ostinesil is not mentioned. I think the, the, the jewel smiths are also not called Gwais Emir Dain. It's also Silmarillion information, right? Yeah, you are right. Yeah, the city itself looks uh, amazing. I would not have guessed that this is so um, Eregion or Ostinesil. As, as um, Harvain just pointed out that it's not mentioned, the cap name of the capital is not mentioned in Lord of the Rings, so they probably don't have the rights for that. Ungoliant is mentioned in the Lord of the Rings one time, interesting. So in theory they could have brought her up, even though her description and what she stands for is also from the Silmarillion mainly. But it's mentioned that at least Shelob's mother's name is Ungoliant, so the name would be, um, as in theory, part of their rights. But yeah, really beautiful place, I have to admit. Not much to say there, um, but here in this place, um, Kilibrimbor explains to Elrond what is going on. Like, we have this beautiful scene here with Elrond and the Hammer of Feanor. And that also, like, he also created the Silmarilli. Uh, with it, the, the jewels, and Celebrimbor also tells a story that um, there was a point where when Morgoth stole the Silmarilli, he just looked at them and he could not um, stop looking at the Silmarilli, was basically like in trance, and then uh, like a tear fell on them and they uh, then he saw his own reflection that um, <laughs> And only that brought him out of this trance. Very interesting. He says basically, um, the, the Silmarilli almost turned the great foe himself. Very interesting way to, to express this. I'm not sure, I, I think this story is not mentioned anywhere in the book, so they made it up. But I've, I think it's an interesting story. It ignores a bit that the problem with, at least in the Silmarillion version, with the Silmarilli is that they were hollowed by Varda, the high angel of stars, if you want, one of the um, the queen of the Valar also, and um, ev like everybody who was evil, ev every evil that touched the Silmarilli, these three powerful gems, um, they, it, they were burned and withered um, doing so, even Morgos, and, or especially Morgos, and he could not endure holding them, so he had to put them in his crown. They use uh, a lot the token phrase, some say, yeah. Oh, exciting. Is the forge he wants to make for this purpose. Exactly. He wants to make, I assume, this forge that is later also the forge that um, is needed to create the rings of power. And then this is the magnum opus of Kilibrimbor then.
Adron had a pretty sad life. Yeah, to some degree, it's very tragic. For people interested in all the in all the information about Elrond, check out my um, history or who is Elrond videos. Currently, take some hours time. There's one ex only about the second age. There's one about the first age and his ancestors, and a couple of one about the third age, which I have not completed yet. I think two or three videos are still missing. Sadly, currently I don't have time to make them, which is very unfortunate. But I will finish with Elrond as well. I wondered about Celebrimbor's schedule. It must be done by spring. I also wonder about this. Like maybe there's a star constellation or something he needs. Maybe, I don't know why it has to be spring. I don't get this as well. well we, we probably will learn about that. No, exactly. It's also not like uh, Elrond goes to Khazad-dum on his own. It's his own idea to do this. It's not the command of Gil-galad or any anything. It just every single line. I think this this part here, this section, I also really liked. Like everything related to Elrond and him going to Khazad-dum. This section here, it's so far, also one of the sections I liked um, a bit more. I have to say, I'm not sure if we missed some crucial details here. We talked already about the hammer. It's yeah, very interesting. Also like the the room here. Um, yeah, I was wrong though. I said um, there was a screenshot where both of them were sitting at a table, and I said it looked a bit like Elrond. Um, yeah, Elrond was guest. No, I was not wrong. I said it was Eregion. I said Elrond was the guest and Celebrimbor looked a, more, a bit more like he was at home. Was it like, was that what I said? I forgot. But yeah, we definitely now know this is in Eregion. Yeah, it shows um, Elrond's ingenuity and diplomacy. Like, I really like how they portray Elrond. Elrond is a herald. A herald is like a medieval diplomat or something um, among those lines. So he goes to other lords and so on and brings them, for example, the word of the king and maybe establishes diplomatic relationships. Something like this could work. Like, when, when people said he is a polit politician, they fe felt like, no, he's not. But I always understood, like, oh, I guess poli politics and diplomacy are not the same, but they are related. For me, I would say, yeah, diplomacy and being a herald is also kind of, like, establishing relationship with another realm and trying to, to, to negotiate stuff that also sounds... Poly, like like what a politician might do here and there, or a diplomat might do there, and that is exactly um, what Elrond is also doing, and I think it's quite fitting. You have to think, yeah, the the dark times. You have to um, look at it like this that. Not even Galadriel could find out who Anatar really was, and um, you can't blame Kiri Brimbo then, especially if he's so ambitious and has ideas and so on. <laughs> I thought his nickname was Harold. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was like an ambassador. Question, is Elrond giving up the competition deliberately? It looks like um, that to me. Yeah, I also would argue he probably did. Like that, it seems to me, um, he knows Durin is angry at him and he tries to convince him by... Um, in German we have the saying, der klügere gibt nach. Um, that is, ex it means like the, the smarter one gives in. 
if that is the, I'm not sure if there's a, a, a proverb in English that is similar to that, but um, yeah, <laughs> I could imagine he um, gives up. We come to that scene uh, in a moment. I would like, and sadly, I, we can't go uh, too much into depth here because I'm too bad at this doing it live. If Kirdan would be there, he could help us maybe out. Wait a moment, I have to search this scene. I have like um, Kili Brimbo shows um, Elrond his plans. What he's going to do, what the project he's work tinkering on uh, means. And he also talks about his ambition, which is kind of fitting to Kili Brimbo. Kili Brimbo was not crazy as Feanor, but he, all he still had the ambition to create, like he was a passionate creator. He wanted to be recognized for for his works. He wanted them to be known and he wanted to maybe even surpass his uh, famous grandfather Feanor in a way, though he was not uh, so incredibly irrational um, when it comes to that. Maybe to some degree, but not fully. And um, that is what I appreciate a bit about him. He's ambitious, but he's not a madman. Maybe, um, I'm not sure how he's portrayed later in the later seasons, but I could imagine that they also go this route that he seems almost like a madman at the end, or maybe not. And um, then, yeah, he's just... Then doom comes over him, but he still does something good out of it in a way. <laughs> Those compound German words. <laughs> Yeah, that's also a good point. Like he, they fought so long that not Elrond gave in, the hammer gave in. You could also see it like, okay, this was the last swing Elrond had and he gave it his all and the hammer just broke. Yeah, exactly. He wanted to make great works of beauty. The elves were artists. He wanted to, he wants to turn Middle-earth also into like a beautiful realm. And that is also in um, uh, aligning very well with um, uh, with what the creations of Kili, Brim uh, of Kili Brimbo do later. Like the rings, the elven rings of power have the power to preserve things. He also did this um, elf stone, which also was able to heal things and make it, um, make it beautiful basically again. So these were the things Kilibrimbor was creating it. and those who possessed the, these rings of power also had beautiful realms as a result because they could preserve it in a way that was similar to the to what is going on actually in Valinor because Middle-earth is a place that is in constant change that is constantly um, changing which is not what the elves like because they are immortal beings they don't want this is changing world around them. So the rings of power gives them the opportunity to create realms that don't change that much, that are almost reminiscent of being in Valinor already and make it for them kind of more, or for, at least for the elves, more endurable while it also makes them um, self develop some desire for leaving Middle-earth. Uh, let me just drink something real quick. Okay. Um, the Silmarils and Rings of Power seems to show how dangerous industry can be. I think Tolkien's idea behind this goes even a bit deeper than just like a criticism of um, industrialization. You might be right that it's part of that, but um, Tolkien has this philosophical concept he calls the machine. It's explained by Christopher Tolkien. There's a video about it um, you find on YouTube. I don't have a link right now, but maybe search for Christopher Tolkien um, interview. 
and maybe machine or something that you should maybe find it. And in this, basically what, what Tolkien means with this is that what is dangerous is the shortcut to power. That you have something that suddenly um, allows you to become much more powerful than you would be without it. So like a machine that allows you to, I don't know, do a lot of work where usually you would have to put in yourself a lot of physical effort in. Suddenly you have a machine, you press a lever or pull a lever or something and it does the work for you. Like it's a shortcut to power in a way. And if it becomes too extreme and out of control and you're only focusing of getting more and more power, then it can get destructive. And that is what Tolkien kind of um, wants to express. It's not an allegory for industrialization because Tolkien hated allegory, but there still were themes and ideas of Tolkien. He wanted to be represented through parts of his story, at least to some degree, in my opinion. And so, um, yeah, th that's definitely a concept Tolkien um, talked about. And it's it's a very fascinating topic. Let me just look for the next scene here. I want to see the uh, the plan that uh, Kili Brimbo shows to Elrond in a moment. Also looking for. Now we don't we can't see it. I think the best shot I have of this scene is this one. I just want to zoom in a bit. No, we can't see it. We need a different shot for that. Like we, we speculated if there's a telescope or something in the background. I found this scene finally. <laughs> Here it is. Yeah, in a way you're right, but of course there were more complex things than a grain mill. For example, they had like um, um, a clock on the wall and so on. So it seems almost anachronistic in this way, but it was, as you try to, I assume, put it, very simple in its way. But it was also a bit anachronistic. Yeah, it was Shire was also at parts of the English countryside and so on. But yeah, I am um, have not worked any minute yet on reading this here. Mode wise, it is not the Beleriand mode because I think we see Techtar. Maybe I'm wrong. We only see very few Techtar. The first, when you want to read Tengwar letters, you first have to um, find out which mode they are written in. I'm very bad with this as well. And then when you have the mode, you can maybe distinguish distinguish if they are written in um, thing. My moderator Kirdan is there. I have almost a feeling it's English. It's English written in Tengwar. Because this here, I think, is my or something like this. Or may? Is it an M even? Probably I'm misinterpreting the letter. No, it's a it's a B. Hey, I should check the English mode. Oh no, it's a could it be a diphthong? It's an I. 
It's it's Bill Elliot mode then. Let me just get in a bit closer here. Yeah, it could be Beleriand mode. By. I would really like to read this, but my my reading capabilities of Quenya uh, of of Tengwar are simply too slow. Like I really need to think too much. I need like a, usually I put I put it in Photoshop and just very slowly read the, write the letters along. If somebody's really good at reading that, feel free to help out. If, at least I would be curious if this is written in actually um, Sindarin or Quenya or if it's written in English. It's phonetic, so could be. It's very interesting that somebody made the effort to write this. Maybe it was uh, Mr. Hostetter who um, wrote this. Definitely a possibility. I find this very interesting. Let me just, sorry for, for being so silent here for a moment and just, uh, oh, that's not the same letter. Okay, I get it now. Huh, interesting. I, I need to, to put, put more. The similarities, it says actual size. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a possibility. Let me just see what chat that says until this scouting. Maybe somebody had already has already translated this stuff would be uh, or transcribed it at least. What if Sauron's plan to create um, the forge? Maybe. Maybe they already had contact and nobody knows. I'm not 100% sure which mode it is, but yeah, it is definitely um, interesting to see. So we have this forge here. There are other plans. Very curious uh, what we might find here out um, l later. What, what's going on with, with this p a particular aspect here in Eregion? And we have yeah, another page, it looks like this. This shows the forge, I think, itself. We have the uh, bellow here. But it's really cool, somebody made this and uh, pretty nice. Definitely was for sure some work. Also some beautiful artwork, maybe by, I don't know, John Howe or so. The bring of gifts, I can, I can tell.
So yeah, these are the plants that Kelly Brimbo shows to um, Elrond. They talk a little bit and they talk about that um, it needs to be done by spring and it needs like an absolute massive workforce. And interestingly, it says uh, Gilgalad can't provide this massive workforce to, to get it done in time. And Elrond um, then proposes, um, yeah, this place here. Interestingly, we now see here on, we, we see a little map piece here, the uh, Glanduin. And Eregion is here on the map. So interesting place. I think most people would maybe put it here, but it's not 100% clear where um, the capital Ostinivil in the region is. As somebody pointed out already, they can't call it Ostinivil. They have to call it then just Eregion, though the whole region here north of this river is Eregion, basically. All we know when it comes to position is that um, somewhere here is the entrance to Moria, to Khazad-dûm, and we know that I think there's also a waterfall somewhere and a road that goes parallel to the river to Ostinivil because the relationship. I potentially would have placed Ostinivil here, but I don't know. They probably don't have the rights. Maybe there are some other um, thoughts on where this is exactly. It's an interesting detail though. And um, yeah, very cool. There's definitely a street going along the river and it leads to um, Moria. And so they were connected and could exchange stuff and so on. They had a very good relationship with the dwarves. And it seems now here in the show it's not already established when Eregion is around, but it is to be established. And they try to explain this, which I find a very interesting idea, I have to admit. Um, yeah, so on the map, I would place it more like here, but it's definitely debatable. And then, yeah, we come to a fantastic scene here. A beautiful landscape shot. I really like those landscape shots. I feel like in a lot of the Rings adaptions, you need those landscape shots at times beautiful place here and somewhere there is in the background the entrance to um, Moria which let me just scroll up a little bit I don't know where it is exactly but round about here yeah, and we see like a lot of water um, we've seen this shot here in a, in a, in a teaser already and then um, it continues of course the, the Misty Mountains are very big mountain so it's possible and the dwarves of course need also access to water in some way so pretty nice what is interesting in this scene here in particular is this shot here. I'm not sure if this is a different entrance or the main entrance to Moria. Hard to tell. We see like a narrow path and even some of these landmarks. At first I thought these were persons here, but it seems like there are some markers on the ground going along the way to Moria. Maybe it's a side entry because... Um, well, probably not because this is so early that the doors of uh, Durin weren't, or Durin's doors weren't made yet here in this place. And there should also be, um, yeah, there, there needs to be, maybe the, the the water isn't there yet. It comes later where the, watch, uh, the watcher lives in. Very interesting. I'm not sure if there was an entrance before the doors of Durin, to be honest. I assume it like I assume yes I assume the 
At some point the dwarves and Eregon must have had a relationship with each other, that's pretty good. And then it's the dwarves were I assume built. But before that the 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 dwarves needed a way to get to Eregion and Eregion to, to Moria. We can even read in one version that both basically helped each other. So Moria became more fair and um Eregion became more strong due to this relationship. Like the elven touch in um Khazad Doom was that it became more fair and the dwarven touch on Eregion was that it became more strong uh, stronger basically. It's a really interesting quote. I forgot where it's written though, sadly. I think it's Unfinished Tales or so. Or it's Silmarillion. If somebody knows the quote and knows where, where to find in the book, feel free to post it in chat. Now I see the tiny door. Yeah, there's a tiny door um, down here. Which we will zoom in in a moment. Uh, no, I don't see it here on my control screen. It's really tiny, I think. I didn't hit it, right? There it is. My uh, my control screen here on OBS is very small, so I don't I have a hard time seeing it here. Yeah, and then um, we see it a bit closer in a moment. Um, in this shot, we also see these markers, I call them. I'm not sure these way cornerstones, I'm not sure what they are called exactly, but these things here. Pretty nice. Yeah, an, an alliance that um, elevated both peoples, exactly. And then, yeah, we have this um, interesting scene that... Um, I found very interesting. Oh, this is also a beautiful shot. Cinematography, um, pretty nice. Of course, there's potentially some post-processing going on here, but still a very nice shot. Yeah, it's probably then the wrong um, side of the mountain. Also ignored my arrow there. Um, yeah, so pretty cool landscape stuff. And then they stand in front of the door in a moment. Uh, pretty nice. Pretty nice shot overall. I like it. It doesn't look like Moria gets a lot of visitors here. Yeah, the uh, Redhorn Pass is further uh, north. That's right. But it's clo relatively close in a way. Not like around the corner, but you know what I mean. Redhorn Pass would be, I don't know, Chad. I don't see it on the map, it's too small. Somewhere here, right? And Moria would be more like here, but yeah, it's definitely further north. Something like that. And yeah, Elrond says something interesting. Um, he says, like, we are welcomed with open arms. Durin is an old friend of mine. Uh, don't worry. And then, yeah, this, this thing here opens and... Um, they, they won't let him in. I'm surprised those two traveled alone on this journey. 
Yes, the the Gilgalad basically declared that the war is over, the evil has ended, and there's no way to worry anymore. I think the evil of Sauron hasn't come to this region yet in any shape or form. So in this time, it's actually pretty safe there for the elves. Who who should the elves fear? <laughs> I like the self-confidence Elrond uh, radiates when um, he basically tells Kilibrimbo to leave the job in a sense. Yeah, it's very interesting in my opinion. Yeah, self-confidence, but also I think remember when Gimli enters Moria, um, when when the Fellowship in the film at least decides to enter um to the West Gate, and he says um yeah I don't know he he talks about I don't know beer and celebrates and fires and has this roman romantic dwarven imagination how it will be to meet Balin there, and the the dwarvish uh, the dwarven hospitality. And so on, and then they, and then he says they call it a mine, and then, um, yeah, the, the scene comes. No, it's a grave. Um, it's it's a pretty cool scene, and a kind of this scene reflects this basically. It's like, yeah, when we get to Moria, we will be served with open arms, and it will be pretty awesome. Then they, no, you can't enter. <laughs> Wait a moment. <laughs> and it takes like three attempts to for him to get even in. That's kind of funny, in this um, regard. Yeah, he was rejected, but then he made the, um, the the challenge. I think what is written here might be a very similar to what we have seen on the other door. This might be the door. There's a photo of Disa, I think, and that was released very early. And I did some um, translation stuff of that before, or not translate. I didn't translate it because it was very few words I could recognize. It seems like they expanded the or invented their based on what Tolkien wrote a dwarven language. That's a bit different from Neo Kuzdul, which uh, we know. But I'm not a Kuzdul expert by any means, so uh, I don't know. I forgot which magazine published that though. Maybe Empire magazine, right? It was not Empire, was it? Van it was not Vanity Fair, was it? Now we come to the realm of, yeah, it was Vanity Fair. We have this door in the background. It's not the same door, but the writing on the door could be the same. Maybe it is even the same door, I'm not sure. The lighting um, is com uh, completely different though. Well, it could be the same door if I'm now thinking about it, just it's further in the background. Maybe it's also photoshopped in some way. I enjoyed the dwarves more than I am thought I would. I, I was looking forward to the dwarves and I was not disappointed. Like this was the part I was looking forward to and I also really liked it. I had expectations and I was not disappointed. So um, there's that. Um, like here on the on one side we can I think read uh, Kazadumo, so of Kazadum, and some, some other text. I maybe I can link the video. I also should maybe create um, a bot command for all the stuff, right? At some point. I'm not even sure if I have. Do I have an Elrond video command for it? I have. Let me just, it's probably um, promotional 
the promotional but if people want to know more about Elrond I made like videos about him let me just see where it is there he is I made a playlist with all the videos in it that are um, part of it they will become one big video that's like eight or nine hours long at the end Exclamation mark Elron should bring it up. I need to make one for Galadriel as well, if I'm honest. There it is. So yeah, there's a playlist in case people want to watch that at some point. We now have a command for that. One doesn't simply walk into Casa Doom, yeah, exactly. But yeah, um I we might look into what is written on the door at some point, but um currently I can't. Um I I made a video, like a breakdown video of the um like of, of, of the posters and some of the trailers early on, which is a scripted video. It was a ton of work. I think at least it was scripted. Maybe it wasn't. But um, where is it? So many windows. I think here in this video, I went through what is written on this a little bit. Yeah, I've I've found the screenshot of it. Maybe I do it like this, probably the easiest to bring it up. But here I basically cut off all the pieces of the um of the door and um, basically try to. So Kazadumo would be off Kazadum. Then there's also, I don't know, there's all kinds of, of thing. We have the uh, Mazarb there, that means um, record. We have Mahal, which means Aule and so on. Now we can maybe see it better because it was really blurry on the screenshot. We had to zoom in quite a bit to get this. It's here from this screenshot. And I assume the door we see in the background has the exact it's maybe the same, just from a far m further away, or I don't know. It has at least potentially the same writing on it. Um, I look later into that if that makes sense. Just for for completeness' sake here. Um, yeah, let us move on a bit. I'm not sure where is OBS there. <laughs> Just so much stuff going on. And yeah, he goes to the door and they won't let him in. And then um, he goes close and challenges them. The Sirin ta uh, Tarak, as he says it. Almost sounds like uh, the Klingon language, but um, I really liked um, the detail there that they um I really like the detail that they put this in like um the the R the throat R instead of the trilled R. Instead of Tarak um they said Tarak and that it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool detail. I think we discussed this in a previous stream already, but it's in appendix E uh, if you check um the letter R they're talking right that not all dwarves did this but it's it, it kind of implies that the dwarves um got this custom at some point or this development in the language usually uh, talking rights um, r represents a trilled r in all positions so it depend it's independent of where in the word the sound was not lost before consonants as an english part where the r basically becomes silent and then he writes the orcs and some dwarves are set to have used a back or uvula or uvula R, ah, a sound which the Eldar found distasteful. And um, yeah, it's pretty cool that they um, went with this pronunciation here. Like, I really like stuff like that.
My favorite quote is when it was helmet, get out of my head. <laughs> We never have seen the faces of dwarf children. No, I think we have never seen dwarf children um, uh, before. So it's pretty cool to see those children. Dwarf children are also pretty rare. And then the door opens and um, he says, yeah, I, I got this. And then we have also the screenshot of today. Um, for uh, for the thumbnail, which is here, and, then, and you see they even have um, something that protects their eyes. Very curious if they can look through that, and people can't look from outside into their eyes. It's maybe like sunglasses under the helmets. I'm not sure, but it's pretty cool in my opinion. And then um, he's guided into the into Casa Doom, and um, yeah, we have like a lot of beautiful shots there in the background. The door opens, and we, we definitely see that Elrond is impressed by how Casa Doom uh, looks now. And he sees, okay, it looks suddenly um, much, much, much better. And he also tells this to um, to Durin that in only 20 years, the dwarves um, made it so much more beautiful. And we have also the epic dwarven music, which I also um, already liked from already liked from the soundtrack. But here, seeing it with the pictures, it r pretty much worked uh, insanely well. We see some people even growing like plants and so on um, down here. They also a shot where they look up to um, Elrond when he goes over this bridge here. And it seems the, grow, uh, the, the dwarves are growing plants inside of Casa Doom, which is a very cool detail. Like they basically redirected maybe some water into it, and they use these um, these 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 light these mirrors to light the crops. So basically, they redirect the sunlight over mirrors into it, so they could grow food. Let me see if I can find the scene. So I assume that is what what the dwarves are doing there. So um, yeah, they to to produce food they redirect the sunlight. That's what, how I would interpret that, and it's a pretty cool idea, I think. I'm not sure how practical it is or how well it would work in reality, but it's it's at least an it, an effort, an explanation for how do the dwarves live there? Don't they need food or anything? I think that is. Um, a pretty cool idea. We can read in very early versions of um, a very early version. There's a version in the uh, peoples of Middle Earth called of dwarves and men, and there it's described that in the early days, the dwarves, for example, of Moria, had very good relationships to the Norsemen, and basically they traded with the Norsemen their knowledge and metalworks and um, taught them to to do. To, to do stuff themselves, but also gave them ore and, and materials and so on. And the Norsemen in, uh, on the other side would grow plants and food for them and give the dwarf food. So that is, um, yeah, pr pretty nice. Yeah, and they can control the growth cycles, exactly. Yeah, much better than lightning everything with torches Minecraft style. Exactly. Oh, whoa, don't didn't see the mirrors. Yeah, it's it's a pretty cool detail. Like I liked that. First I thought, what are the mirrors for? But then I said, ah, that is for growing stuff. It is to redirect the sunlight and so on. We already have seen something like this in the um, in the Moria um, from the Lord of the Rings. That there were also some, like uh, the chamber of Mazabul, for example, had also light shining into it. And I think in the distance um, here and there in Moria, we also saw like um, parts where light from outside went into the mountain. So this idea was always there. I'm not sure how exactly it's described in the books, but it. And for me, it's very plausible. 
Yeah, so never talk about missing <laughs> melanin in, uh, for dwarves again. Yeah, they're just simply sitting inside the light of the mirror all day and then they get a very good um, tan. <laughs> just <laughs> very funny. Also, the dwarves looks, uh, look all pretty, uh, pretty awesome. Some pretty cool dwarf shots here and there. So yeah, the Moria section I liked um, quite a bit. There's also um, some oxes there that transport something. I'm not so sure what it is exactly. Like here, this thing here. There's also like a, like so some dwarves bringing something here. It seems important. All these dwarves are hooded or cloaked. And they're also even dwarves standing to the side. And here we have two guards. I find this interesting. Here's also a text standing on this here. And here's a crown. So it seems basically um, maybe this is going to, um, not to Durin the fourth, but his father Durin the third. Possibility. I would try to zoom in this a little bit to maybe see fur further details here. But sadly, that's all I can do. Well, that's another thing. I could try to get this a bit crisper, the image. Now, if I sharpen it, that's the best I can do here. Yeah. <laughs> Dudin's wife likes to sunbath in those mirrors, exactly. Oh, there's a nice crescent moon and star in the mirror light. Uh, just a little forward of this uh, shot below. The platform on the left. Okay, that might be hard to find. Crescent moon. Uh, after, uh, before this shot, so a bit earlier into this um, thing here. Crescent moon. What did you say on which point? Forward and below the platform on the left. I'm not sure exactly when you are in the tra uh, when you what 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 was it, what you're watching. The Balro cocoon, yeah, maybe. Platform to the left. Now I'm very curious to find that. The problem is I can't show you the stuff here because that would bring me into trouble.
I still don't see it. Sorry. Maybe I'm blind. Oh, wait a minute. You mean this here? I can do an AI upscale of the um, of the Balro cocoon. <laughs> it's hard to describe here, but no, probably I should move on as we are sitting here very long time but there will be details i missed for sure i tried to look out for it um later so yeah then um elrond is escorted into the um, what's it called yeah, into a chamber with a lot of dwarves standing there and cheering, which is a pretty cool scene. I have to play it forward and watch below the platform on the lower left. Okay, uh, we'll look later into this, else I will never get it done, but there seems to be more to it. Now, there's a lot of tumult here in in this scene. We see like uh, then Durin entering, and there are um, all the dwarfs with their beards and so on. The dwarfs look pretty. Dwarfs, dwarfs look pretty good. Yeah, a dwarf club, the dwarf fight club. And then he he pulls up his hand, and everybody um just. Shut up for a moment. It's a pretty cool scene, in my opinion. He shouts, Kazad, and there's a <laughs> doom. Especially this one, uh, this dwarf there in the in the row, are very funny. That's my opinion. Pretty cool shot. <laughs> The dwarf's having a good time. I also like how um, Elrond speaks very friendly to him. My heart sings like this elvish poetry, basically. <laughs> and um, Durin just interrupts him. <laughs> it's, it's very funny, in my opinion. Like a throne hall? Yeah, maybe. Very hard to tell. Dwarves like to have a good time. I agree. They definitely uh, do. And then they have this... Um, yeah, war, war. It was really true. There is a rock smashing competition. Some pretty awesome dwarf shots from the background. Like after a long day working um, stone and so on, he now wants to see a good competition of rock smashing in the evening. Having a good time, pretty, pretty nice. And yeah, the, basically uh, the rules are explained. There's one dwarf with with a golden ear as well. And he looks a bit like Dwalin, I feel. Minus the ear. But yeah, uh, some, some pretty awesome uh, dwarven shots here and there. I like that quite a bit. And it's basically said, okay, if he win, if Elrond wins, he gets a single boon. And if the um, dwarf wins, or if he, for, if he gives up, um, he's banned from all Dwarven Kingdoms. Is the Dwarf ready? And then, um, yeah, the, the, is the Elf ready? A 
That's a pretty cool shot. And Elrond also um, gets rid of his 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 uh, what do you call it mantle cloak cape. Yeah, also like the, the singing of Disa and knowing where to um, where to dig and where not to dig is definitely a pretty cool thing. Including his defeat. Yeah, I could imagine that too. Like, I really like <laughs> Elrond um, seems to know what he's doing there. So Disa has definitely sideburns. Um, these uh, female dwarves here don't have sideburns though. So it's not on all of the dwarves, but uh, on some. Still, they look pretty dwarvish. I have to give them credit for that. Maybe the shot with his horn here, also pretty cool. Like, there's so many details. It's cut it relatively fast. So um, you have to really watch it frame by frame to appreciate all the details that we see here. Um, th this shot here also, like the detail, the mug is not empty. There's actually something in the mug of him. You see a bit of maybe beer or so. Pretty, um, yeah, it's pretty, <laughs> like, it's, it's oozing details, which is just so cool to see. Yeah, rules hit rock with hammers until you're exhausted. <laughs> it's a pretty easy game, but hard to master, I assume. And then the uh, rocks are um, brought into the competition and they start. We only see, I think, the first rock smashing thing, but not the, the others. It's an interesting point. Maybe they stopped singing at some point, but um, yeah, hard to hard to tell what led to their demise. Usually, it's just that they were too greedy. Well, this dwarf here also has a time of his life, I feel. <laughs> it's just such a cool shot. Uh, I love it. You, ha you have to really like it. And then Elrond also splits a rock, as we have seen in an edit already, um, in one frame or so. Yeah, they, they delve too deep. And then we have a cut and um, we are back here now in this region. So in the next uh, section, let me just see where is it going. We see Nori going through um, the wild here, through East Rovanion. Here we see her, pretty cool. Maybe they disregarded the mountain's advice and uh, mined where they uh, should not have mined. Yeah, good, good point. Mm, 
Yeah, they wanted the mithril, and then at some point they found the balrog and woke it up, and then fell. But this happens two, I don't know, in this uh, two thousand years into the third age. So much, 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 much later. And yeah, now she comes. Now we come to an interesting scene already. Uh, we see Nori checking Nori checking her friend. And then she notices he's gone. He already is up. And then they have this fateful meeting there where he is also putting on like star constellations on this on this rock. Like the star constellation stuff is one of the things that also keeps me thinking that this might not be Sauron. Because um, some of the stars were placed there to basically... Um, I don't know, draw a line for the evil uh, entities of the world. Just to oppose them, as we can read. So yeah, in this scene, um, a lot of things happen. I don't know how to break this down. We see the stranger now at daylight. Could he be a young Gandalf? Who knows? Who knows? And then when Nori comes close, he just shouts and creates this shock wave. And she says, stop that already. And then there's the trailer shot here in it too, where we see like these trees bend in some way. It seems also like they get um, a bit darker, if that makes sense. Like it's hard to see here, but um, something like that. And even in the background, you see how it becomes darker, like almost like a stormy day. Like, look at this. Like, something is definitely also happening further away. Quite interesting. And yeah, but he stops and recognizes her as a friend and they have a pretty cool moment, which is also um, pretty cool. Like he has this, like, like look at his eyes in this shot. Like there's definitely something going on inside him. It's not just like he can't control his power like an infant. There's definitely something that bothers him or bothers his mind here. It creates this reaction. Like this shot in particular really give me that impression there's like two souls in him there's one soul that is kind that is kind and one that is not and those are constantly fighting or fighting over control if that makes sense i don't know um what is uh, going on there like let's let's pretend it is sauron who really takes up this disguise and puts a lot of effort into it and now i don't know um, we nothing is you know the the quote that often is online posted, but in a way, there are some similar quotes to that that say nothing is evil in the beginning. I think Galadriel um, also says something like that in, in in the show here, as in the in the prologue. But even Sauron was one um, a Maya of Aule, and he was also one of the of the of the good spirits. But at some point, he decided to join Morgos or Melkor, and then he became one of the of, of his servants and was was on the on the dark side maybe when he also pretended to be like in something like distantly related to an e-star if that would be the case um he also basically starts 
on a good level, but the evil part in him becomes stronger and stronger, something like that. I'm not sure. Just a theory. But yeah, he looks definitely like he has uh, trouble there. But I like how um, the actor plays this pretty well. Like he's of course a very talented actor, but there's also like an it also two Italian shots back to back. Here we see the sh uh, close uh, the Italian shot of uh, Nori, also pretty nice. And yeah, then he just calms down again. But yeah, this, this shot gives gives really some some tense. Like I think this cinema, when it comes to cinematography, it's really um, impressive. And then uh, he basically feels somewhat exhausted and let go again. So now we are back to meteor man territory again. And <laughs> he's jet lag. Yeah, maybe he has jet lag. Yeah, exactly. We we, uh, we discussed this in, in the previous round where at the beginning Galadriel says this place is so evil um, the fire doesn't emit warmth and here we also had this when Nori fell down the crater where the meteor impacted. Um, it also the fire do, it did not feel hot and also if you remember let me uh, from from the from the Peter Jackson films, but also from um, from the Lord of the Rings. I'm not sure how it's phrased there. Yeah, I think Gandalf really says. Um, Let me see, I found it. Frodo gave a cry and groped the tongs, but Gandalf held him back. Wait, he said in a commanding voice, give, giving Frodo a quick look from under his bristling brows. And then no apparent change came over the ring. And then it continues and continues. And um, he basically yeah, throws the ring into, the, in, into fire. And for a moment the wizard stood looking at the fire. Then he stopped and removed the ring um, uh, to the hairs from uh, with the tongs, and at one at once picked it up. Frodo gasps. It's quite cool, as we hear it also in the films. Take it. Frodo received it on his uh, shrinking palm. It seems to have become thicker and heavier than ever. But yeah, you already this quite cool is also concerning with the ring. Like we have something that should be hot but isn't. It's definitely um, a connection we see with Sauron. I think that's a pretty strong argument. Um, but uh, we talked about this previously. Whatever symbol star constellation it is, it's closer to the R than the G. Yeah, it is. It does not seem like a G letter um, in 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 Kiers. That is true. We come to that in a moment. Let me just. Maybe we see the scene here next. But now we have the, the eating scene with the snails. I guess we don't have to discuss this. Like what, what I really liked about this scene we talked about in the watch party already. That uh, Nori really uses her hand to basically uh, mimic some stuff there. Uh, not mimic but, but make some gestures with her hand. Like I, I really like how how she plays this. Like it's, it's kind of it has something. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it something adorable. And she has like a lot of confidence as well. And she also makes this 
she also pulls her ear and so on. And then um, the stranger mimics this. Also, very, very adorable scene. She had a sign for her name. Yeah, that is also interesting that she had one. Actually, I was positively surprised about the stranger. I just have a bit worried who he might be and how much they would change the law in a way and maybe add a story that potentially doesn't fit into this particular um, place. But I feel like the stranger, how he's, how the actor plays him and so on, is very interesting and competently made. Um, as I said, I really like the Harfoot stuff um, overall quite, quite a lot. And it, w it will be interesting to see where they are going with this. So they definitely have my attention here, but I'm also a bit worried, I have to admit. She makes yeah, this gesture she makes for her name. Maybe somebody has an idea why she does it. But um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I have to add a thing a bit of, of uh, Franken, uh, Frankenstein. Franken, how do you pronounce it in English? German pronunciation would be Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Whatever. Yeah, and then we have the snail scene. Be, it brings him something to eat, which is maybe a bit unusual food for a lot of people, but I guess, um, yeah, hobbits seem to be not that picky there. Um, that short hair elf, uh, when he says the past is with us uh, 1,000 years. Yeah, that is true. The Harfoots might have to um, communicate while hiding, so maybe they have a sign language. Uh, of course, I'm worried about the stranger as well, but as far as I've seen it so far, um, he made a good entrance. That is true. Yeah, I agree. All the stuff is um, pretty interesting. I find it funny um, that the stranger eats the whole um, snail, including her house. <laughs> and then we have this parallel montage, I would call it, where we see a uh, lago. And he's, he's basically doing stuff like the father of Nori, I think. And yeah, that's very interesting. I assume his injury leads to him later needing a staff to walk. That's basically what I think. Really hard to tell. And you, that is potentially also why his daughters are usually pulling the cart and not him. So that might also be related to that's my prediction from what we know from the trailers already. Seems like he gets somewhat healed and back to his feet, but probably can't um, pull anymore when he gets the injury later in the in a few scenes ago. Let me just continue with the interesting stuff. So the stranger then at w some point picks up like a stick and starts drawing something into the ground. Let me see if I get a good scene here. Yeah, this one should work. And there's also some snails already. I like that they're lying around <laughs> there. Maybe from the eating. I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's when the stranger stick breaks. The, the question is, is he the cause of, of the injury? Or is he the... Um, Or 
what do you call it? Not the cause of the injury, but the... Uh, Like, I don't know, it's, it's basically happening in parallel because it's part of the prophecy or of a prophecy or whatever of fate. Or is he the cause of it? That I think is um, a very interesting question. They also imply that something might happen with the shot on the rope and we see the rope doesn't look too good here and it might break. That's a weird choice for Hobbits. Yeah, yeah, for potentially, I guess it's 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 a strange choice, but they probably, um, like I guess if you have to hide all the time, you can't be that picky. If that makes sense, and maybe they're easy to find and have good, uh, I don't know, are healthy for them or whatever. Hard to tell. Yeah, uh, just my microphone is not there. And um, what is kind of interesting, like the 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 um, stranger starts moving his arm more and more, and then when he stops, this incident happens. And I see, I think also the stick he had, you can't see it, but you can hear it. I think that it breaks. And this moment also, um, the injury happens for Largo which is um, kind of interesting. And then you see, for example, this net here. And when um, Largo falls down, I've shown you the scene a moment while I was still muted because I had to eat a snack for a moment. <laughs> yeah, I know, Chris constantly eating. Oh, I'm still in the mode. I have to be careful here. Ah, why is it so complicated at times? Where is the scene? Let me just search the scene really quick. But yeah, he he then fell over basically, and then um, we 
we, we have a we have an interesting um scene here. Like Lago falls down like this, and we see this net thing is also coming down. And in the next scene we have a very short shot, which I find um interesting. Where the where, where we basically see the net fall on the camera. And we see this. And if you look at this particular pattern, um it's somewhat similar um, to like it gives an. I, I really like this cut. I have to admit, it, it's a. Str you might think it's strange, but then we see um, the stranger standing up, and you see that the structure of the net is somewhat similar to the clothes of the stranger. If that makes sense. Oh no, my cat is vomiting. Oh, <laughs> good luck. All the best to Mr. C oh, Mrs. Cat. Meets back on the menu, Chris. Yes, we can't hear yet. Now it should be uh, working again. I hope. These long streams. Is La Lagos the father of uh, Nori? I think not of Poppy, though. I think Poppy is just a friend of Nori, and um, yeah. So, I don't know, I kind of like this cut. Um, especially when he stands up. Let me see if I can get a frame. Like, you also see this um, net structure here. You know what I mean? Like, it definitely feels like it's it's connected. Like, the last shot gives you an association of the association with the next shot or an impression of the next shot in a way. I kind of like that. I just thought it's a pretty cool edit. Maybe it also wants to show that this is somehow connected or not. Fails alarm, all good. Okay, good to hear. And now we see some symbols, which I could not make too much sense out of yet. Here it is. Like this symbol here in the other direction would be a T, but it's not a T. Maybe it's a TH. I can't see what this symbol here is. I even have no idea how he carved it into the very with a stone or so. But he doesn't have a knife or anything. It's currently looking at these uh, all these letters here. What could it be? T H. I don't. I don't recognize it to be honest. Could be like a W sound. It's yeah, it's it's really strange. If somebody has a good idea in chat, let me know. I could not figure anything out uh, just yet. The last letter we see is this one here, and if it's a Kier's letter, it's either I don't know. 
could be the W, could be the DH, so the like the TH and they, the voiced version of it. It's definitely not the G letter. Else it could be a the 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 weird sound the ch sound. It's really strange. But so far, no, I, c I can't make much sense out of what is written there. The carvings look old, they should be white. That's probably an interesting idea. Maybe he did it last uh, a day prior or so. But maybe they just made it so you can clearly see them. Yeah, and po when Poppy is appearing, she has this interesting way to walk. Like, it looks a bit funny. But it's kind of fitting for her character in a way. It's uh, pretty cool what the actress did there. And yeah, the the stranger also feels uh, threatened again. But uh, Nori basically calms them down. Like, she she does a really good job here, I think. Also like the scene composition because in this scene um, Poppy looks as tall as a stranger and just Nori looks very very small. I think this is deliberately done though. Like I said, uh, scene composition, cinematography and so pretty pretty nice. Like if Nori, I think if Poppy would look smaller the scene would not would not work. And yeah, then um, the mother is treating the uh, Lago. I forgot Marigold is her name, I think. Marigold Lago. She treats her husband's um, injury. And uh, yeah, Nori is, is there. And she's said that she, she wasn't there for their parents. So it's an interesting little internal conflict. On one side, she wants to help the stranger. On the other side, it um, yeah didn't help too much, if that makes sense. I figure out Meteor Man is Hurin, the mountain. He was on, exploded, and he flew away. That's a, probably one of the best explanations I heard so far. And then yeah, she talks to the um, to the sisters or whatever, um, Melva and the sisters or whatever, and um, also Sadok. And he asks Sadok asks them, can he migrate? So when they start moving again, can they walk? And all the others are also very curious. And Nori is not in the mood to answer that. She feels like, oh no, that could be actually a problem. Um, very interesting. And um, Melva makes like a very snarky comment. Uh, on her and then Poppy like I really like this scene like there's a lot of tension a lot of things happening there and um, Poppy then also gives her a com comment that she basically um, tend should tend her own fires or something um, like that and I like though that Poppy protects Nori here and like I don't know it's 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 very interesting usually That, that that makes this is a scene I think that makes Poppy really shine in this um in this scene. Like it shows compassion for Nori at the same time, and um, she wants to help her, and she knows that a stupid comment is not what she l currently needs or so. About um her father and so on.
and those uh, few shots they've made the Harford community more tangible compared to the elves. And I can see that they just um, did a really good job with the Harfords, I think. Yeah, here, this is a shot, by the way, where um, Poppy, like, he does a stupid comment and then Poppy returns and tells, uh, tells her what he thinks about that comment. I really like that scene. It's a pretty cool shot. And yeah, then um, the next scene, yeah, mind your own business comment. I wonder where they are planning to migrate. Yeah, that's also curious what, what we learn from that. I have to say, um, even though this is like potentially very fan fiction-ish, it seems like they put a lot of effort in world building this so it seems it seems to work in a way that's um definitely what i'm um, seeing here and then we see galadriel still swimming like she started swimming probably yesterday still swimming tomorrow <laughs> today and yeah she's in the middle of the ocean and yeah i find this strange simply because First, I thought this uh, this scene here would be related to her attack. I find it strange because, she, like, it's so unlikely if you're in the middle of the ocean that swimming that you find like a ship or anything. It's just <laughs> really what a what a coincidence. Yeah, the um, have your have your wheels come off your cart. I also really love that. Yeah, the ocean thing was not the best choice. I thought this would be related to the fight with the sea monster, but it's not. It's it, it, at the distance she sees that something is getting closer to her. And if you would see this in the fog, also a beautiful shot, um, suddenly this building here, this construct appears, you would think, okay, that's a sea monster attacking me, but it's in this case not. And it's indeed some people on a raft and um, just randomly in the ocean, um, um, they, they they basically find like another survivor or so, and they of course know that this survivor was not on their ship, so she needs to be different. The strange thing though is these are not elves; these are men, and we are close to Valinor. Like, how long did Galadriel swim, and how much? past did she do in the in the couple in the in, in the past like that seems so strange to me like of course i get that um you um yeah, i don't know galadriel is of course powerful and that they want to play with all this fate part maybe in 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 tolkien's world that maybe it was like her fate to not die there for example we have beautiful artwork also shout outs to kimberly 80 um, in the first age, Voronwe was also sent to Valinor um, to get help there for the elves in, in Beleriand. And he also, he and seven other ships were, uh, the seven ships were sent and he was one of, on one of them. And then he also got into a storm because the Valar, the, um, the elves were banned at this time from, um, from Amman, from the West Continent. And then his ship was sunk, or all the seven ships were sunk into the storm. But he was saved by uh, by Ulmo and then was washed up ashore in Middle-earth. So it is possible to drown on your way to, um, to Amman and then be washed up at the shore. But usually not by simply swimming there, usually by the grace of Ulmo, which they maybe should have played a bit more here with the Galadriel section if they might reference this first age um, shipwrecked person here with Galadriel. 
but instead she just swims and for whatever reason some other people that like men are in generally banned to um, go to the west continent Amman so here men should not be here I'm not sure how close Galadriel was but she could already see the land so in my opinion she is just insanely far away from uh, Middle Earth and why would normal people they're probably not Numenorians or so doesn't they don't look like it why would they be here like who who sails there for what reason that that seems to me completely off I have to say like she gets found like if she would get found by a Numenorian ship I would kind of say okay maybe she was just she managed with I don't know the way the the waves go what do you call it in English not stream what do you say strömung in German the flux of the sea I guess or the current the current is a word like the current pushed her closer to Numenor and then a Numenorian ship found her so by accident even that would be very unlikely to happen but it may be kind of possible but no she gets found by some people maybe from I don't know from from what is it called um Umbar or so I, I have no idea where, where these people are coming from why are they on a ship and why they are somewhat close to Numinor Valinor or whatever it makes just no sense like w who are those people it seems insanely strange Now, as said in stream, it's a, it's a leap of faith for her uh, on her side. That's not unusual for Tolkien's concept of destiny fate. It is true, though. But they could have made gave her a leap of faith that seems a bit more plausible in the end. Like this is just okay. She gets leaped, and and who are those people? What are they doing here? <laughs> how how do they get there? I mean, they must be close to Numenor or so. Even maybe close to Amman. No, but no humans sail there because they are not allowed to go there. Like who else is gonna be out there? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe Numenorians at, at best, and if not them, then elves. We know that elves sailed from uh, Amman to uh, Numenor at times and visited them. Not that late in the Second Age, but. As we have learned, we are, I guess, very early in the Second Age. So that would make sense that she's found by an elven ship that goes to Numenor. Even that would be more plausible than random people on a raft that also got shipwrecked. Or something like that. It's just... I don't I don't get this. Like, it's, a, it's such a strange scene. Like, I like the cinematography. And um, yeah, I don't know. The woman that um, says, "Yeah, let's help her out," um, basically says, um, "We don't get saved by." I forgot how she phrases it. Does somebody remember? We don't get saved by crew. Um, we how how did she did? She said something pretty cool, I think. Yeah, Elendil was pretty tall, like 241 or something in one version. The dislike of elves would be um, consistent with corrupted Numenorians. Yeah, maybe you are right because they probably don't like elves. Maybe these are Numenorians or in, in some shape or form. Really hard to tell. Let me just see if I can look up what she said there because I'm just that curious.
Yeah, cruelty will not be our deliverance. I I, I thought this would is a is a pretty nice way, what what she said there. It's interesting that she later um, kicks her. And in the meantime, Halbrand is completely unimpressed and talks to Galadriel, which is also strange, kind of. Like um the the woman is now discussing with the with uh, this man here. And um, yeah, and while they discuss, which is so strange, almost like um, like somebody who is, I don't know, completely above everything that happens on this boat. Uh, Halbrand is sitting there, looking at her, and just chatting casually with her. Um, really interesting scene, I think. But it makes uh, it's pretty hard to tell what's going on. He also holds um, the hand like there's this this gesture to basically imply a uh, don't come here yet or so. Very interesting. Yeah, they reference being from the Southlands. At least Halbrand is from the Southlands, as he um, later tells on the boat. Like I would maybe uh, watch the scene here again. So um, yeah, Halbrand says something interesting. He says. Um, to her, like, he holds her hand um, in front of her face and says, stop. And he says, the tides of fate are flowing. Yours may be heading in or out. Like, very interesting. Maybe, um, or maybe he just implies, basically, that... Depending on how the people on the boat decide she's in or out, and Galadriel gets back into the water while trying to climb up. Yeah, Halbrand being the Witch King is also something I can see. How did he get there? Yeah, I don't. I have no idea. I have so many questions about this uh, particular scene here. Like it's it's really strange. Yeah, maybe she should, she should be swimming and push the boat the boat to the shore. Yeah, Halbrand literally feeds his companions to the fish dragon. Galadriel points a finger on him, but um, it has no consequences. Seems to be a lazy uh, story writing. It's hard to tell. Maybe he has really some influence on these people there on the boat like what what wonders me mostly in the scene if you watch it it feels like Halbrand is even on is not even on the boat like you know what I mean he, he seems to be completely isolated from what happens to the other people I find that um, let's say interesting I'm very curious which direction they go with Halbrand. And then the the woman um, helps her, which I, which I find is a really fascinating scene, though. Like she helps her out, pulls her on the boat. She argues with the other guy to um to to let her on the boat but um in the end um, when she learns that she's an elf she pushes her out of the boat again i don't know why that is though but maybe these are also southlanders it's really strange
Yeah, that is true. He he cuts the ropes to the others like he has no compassion for the others in any shape or form. He later cuts this, and then we have like this scene on the boat, and we have the uh, incredible. We we have it in chat. Pouring water on somebody's um, face, like this is a, just a movie trope. It's the same as phone calls never end, truly ending or so. Like, like when, when you have a phone call, and the people just hang up when it ends. It's never like, okay, see you next time. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> One of those movie tropes that, ha that has to have to be in every film. When, when the opportunity is there. I have to watch that again. Yeah, it's an interesting scene, I think. Both Southlanders and corrupted um, Numenorians were just like elves. Yeah. Hard to tell which they are for 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 uh, which they are from for sure. Yeah. As discussed in number one, he might is he the king of the Southlanders? Maybe he's the king that the people wait to return. Hard to tell. And yeah, we, we can see that the woman um, gives her um, the water and then um, the other dude pulls the water away from, from, from her again. That's, that's enough. Like we have to, we don't have much water here. Very interesting scene. And then, um, yeah, somebody, and it's not Halbrand, I think, maybe it's him looking at her. He's, sus he's definitely suspicious. And... Uh, Or maybe it's the other man. No, it, it's the man I just showed to you. And he just uh, walks up um, to Galadriel and he is the one who pulls up her hair. And Galadriel is not happy some, if somebody touches her hair. So yeah, very interesting dynamic. I kind of like the dynamic on this boat. Maybe I almost wish it went a bit longer or so, or these became her companions in, over time or so. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like how they solved it, it, it feels like a weird opportunity. Because all, all this section is completely lost. And then now the, 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 the woman that helped her is really disappointed in her and pulls her back in, uh, and kicks her off the boat. And then basically, yeah, now with Galadriel being there. At the horizon. Um, they see a boat and then, oh, a boat. And then, oh no, it is our boat. It can't stay long. Uh, but my gosh, Chris, have you slept at all, dear? I have. I slept, um, I don't know, from basically noon to evening, and now I'm here. Wait a moment. How long am I streaming? Or oh, just three hours? No problem. We had a watch party of four hours. Oh, boy. But yeah, very nice for your um, shoutouts to Reflective Rambling. Nice to see you here. Well, 79 years, um, the one at the out uh, has been... The outpost there. Yeah, it, it, after the, I think the show is uh, supposed to play um, one thousand years in the f into the f uh, second age. So the War of Ras is one thousand years into the past. So it could be a lot of generations. Not just uh, seventy nine years, but maybe they put it even closer. I don't know the timeline. The problem is when you mess around with the timeline so much, putting anything into kind of a relation, um, it it feels like, you know, it, nothing makes sense anymore. 
Uh, that's why I ask. I mean, um, three hours. No, it's sweet, but I watch uh, watch party first. Uh, someday you're going to uh, for world record, I swear. No, probably not. I, I don't want to go for world records on this. They're like people that are absolutely crazy. But I cut the stream into half. Like I started a new stream for this particular one where we discuss episode number two in a lot of detail. How far are we into the episode though? <laughs> okay, bad news. <laughs> we're, we're around about at half time. <laughs> so, well. Halband reminds me of Viggo Mortensen. Yeah, I think that's definitely the style they're going with with him. However, Viggo Mortensen, especially the character Aragorn, is 100% like he had a much more positive aura than um, he, he really managed to nail this something is not right about me feeling. Most humans on the series just last uh, one episode. That is true. So I would have wished that this boat stuff here would be a bit longer. But yeah, I couldn't puzzle out how this stuff here works. However, they now look at this and then we see the sea monster, which is a pretty cool scene, I have to admit. Okay, sorry, just had to um, eat something pretty quick. Small snack. No, forgot to get along. Yeah, well, now it starts attacking and we see this scene here. And the monster just passes them and then you see the tail in the background. That is like a classic, um, what do you, like, the, um, it's a classic suspense shot, like, I don't know, Hitchcock would do or so. Like, you see the problem in the background already, and you say, oh, no, turn around the other way or something. And, yeah, then the boat is hit by the, by the tail here, I think. And yeah, then, I don't know, things happen. And now they are attacked, basically. It's also pretty well acted by um, this woman that helped Galadriel here. You definitely see her, like, a lot of trouble happened. She's disappointed that he, she feels like she was um, betrayed by Galadriel, that she is an elf. Even though it, it's maybe a, a strange thing to feel betrayed for, but she thought, okay, I, I'm, I'm going some, doing something good. I helped somebody, and then this person is an elf, which I don't like elf, elves, for example. I'm not sure why. Like, the Southlanders don't li like elves, the Numenorians don't like elves. And um, then we also get attacked by the sea monster at the same time. So in her in her view, um, she is, like, really angry at Galadriel for basically causing all this trouble for her. And um, then what she does is um, she... Um, pushes Galadriel into the water. I, I find I found this a very interesting scene. That she it pushes Galadriel into the water back. Like it, it's her who saved her and it's her who pushes her away.
that the bomb, bomb goes never to explode. Yes. There are multiple things that Hitchcock, of course, established. Also, the bomb that does not explode. That a scene is tense, but it never basically um, um, reduces the suspense and so on. But yes, also the scenes where you see the the um, the problem in the background and it's getting closer. That's also something he did. Like he, he in my opinion, established multiple things there. It's not like. He only did one style, like he had many methods of creating suspense. That it's definitely a, a shot where, uh, where you... It's not its not classic suspense, it's probably the wrong word, but it's just definitely you see the, pr the, the trouble at the rise and you want to shout at the screen, turn around, turn around, and they don't do this. This is what I mean. She lied about her earth ears and her ship. Yeah, that is true. Kind of. I'm off to bed. Okay, thank you, Lady Fantastic, for staying so long. It was just a really long stream again. <laughs> Hitchcock was a creeper, but such a cinematic genius. Yeah, that's true. In not one way, but... You might be right that the comparison is a bit lacking, but... Um, Definitely, I like this shot. That's just that's all I wanted to point out. And now, um, yeah, they, she pushes Galadriel into the water. And I like these underwater shots. Like, they put so much effort into this. Like, she pushes that, there's a camera down there, it's filmed, and so on. Like, I really like how they um, did this. Uh, pretty, pretty neat. Like cinematography is so beautiful in these um, episodes. And this scene I did not fully understand, to be honest. Maybe it explains why this, why this sea monster is angry at them because. It has this harpoon in his in his tail, as we can see here. And then we have a weird, not a weird, but we have an interesting shot on Galadriel's eyes in a moment. Italian shot again. Pretty, pretty neat. And then, uh, let me just see the next shot, it's hard to hit. We see like a zoomed in version, version of this shot. So but Galadriel seems to notice that something is going on with the tail. Maybe that is why it's so aggressive and angry because it has, it hurts or whatever. And do we know how much was practical? They were in this gigantic tank and filmed this. So like the, the, the uh, raft you see was definitely practical. But uh, and the water is also practical. The background, though, was um, of course post-production and edited into it. I guess the sea monster and parts. I'm it's probably also. I don't know how much practical stuff um, there is with the sea monster, but it looks pretty good. I have to admit. I assume there were also practical effects going on there, like for splashing the water um, left and right or so. I could imagine that. I, th I think they don't tell how much each episode costs. Um, it might even be uh, depending from uh, on the episode. But you ask on average, right? So I'm not sure how big their budget is for the for all the stuff they did in the first season. I think it was pretty expensive because everything had to be built. Now that everything is built, it, the the production costs go down. I th I assume a little bit. And then now we see Halbrand, and um, he sees that the monster is basically making um, a turn around and attacks a boat again. That's, and now what he does is he starts messing with the ropes. Like, I, I assume his part of the raft he starts to untie because he knows, okay, I need to get away from these people. It will be a problem otherwise.
could be sea monster tied with also maybe could be like um, related to it i assume what this shot that i just showed tries to establish it's maybe some big fish in the water if we look on the um, second age map somebody made a sea monster on this map actually this is um, the john howe map and in the in the ocean in belegayer um we have a little sea monster there so maybe that is also um where the shot plays like it is in case you're looking for it it is um uh, west of the um w west of gondor basically this is Gondor, the White Mountains, and so on. Pretty funny uh, detail, but... So maybe they are up there again, but yeah, pretty hard to tell. Uh, I was looking at Maya um, earlier, so it's on the brain. Yeah, I can imagine that. It, it, I don't think the, the great sea monster is a Maya. I could imagine it is a reference to the... Um, I forget the, and the name of the poem again. I can't memorize it. I, I always forget it. Let me just see. I won't find it here. I need a index. Yes, an index. What is it called, Chad? Fastito Kalon. However you pronounce this, I have no clue. Like if you anglicize it. He wrote a poem before Lord of the Rings and so on, and later he used it for Lord of the Rings stuff. And uh, in the Adventures of Tom Bombadil, there's this poem, and it also is about like a big sea monster thing like here. I think this might be a reference to that. <laughs> Five we time for you. <laughs> Have a good time. Middle Earth Moby Dick, exactly. In my understanding, um, the fish dragon was longer than expected. Yeah, they call it also a worm. So, like a sea dragon or so. Very interesting. But yeah, my imagine, my, in my uh, prediction, I think I thought that they find out that Galadriel is an elf and maybe... They know that elves are bent and that is what is causing all the trouble for them. But in this scene, um, they didn't go for that approach. Very uh, strange. And yeah, here with, with the messing with the ropes, in this scene you see here's Halbrand and he removed his part of the boat from the others. And Galadriel is just uh, swimming for her life. And yeah, in this shot you see like the person there flying around and stuff. And um, then at some point... And then at the very end the big tail just crushes the boat. Now we have seen this uh, in a trailer already. Now you can just go frame by frame here because we have seen this is trailer footage. Yeah, 
in the background you even see two persons in the water. I'm not sure if they are dead or not. Like here and here. Two persons from the boat in the water. This is before the uh, big... Um, the, the, the big tail crushes the boat though. And then after that the persons are just gone. And the boat is gone and we see Galadriel lonely in the water. Now, sorry, I can't um, allow though that you express uh, that you exchange where you can watch stuff illegally here. I don't mind you doing that, but um, because I can't uh, do this, but I can't, of course, promote illegal sites here on my chat while being alive on YouTube. I have to uh, consider that. Oh, I'm just playing this. I should not play this here live. <laughs> but yeah, Galadriel in the water. Then we have a slow motion shot of her. Because now she's pretty much screwed. Like she, she found the the boat and everything and um, was basically saved. She only had to get along with these people on the boat. And then now everything just crumbled again. Like, um, I think that's what they're going to say. Okay, I probably don't, I, I can't swim much, really much longer. And I'm lost on the ocean. No idea why I am. There's a sea monster in the water that just killed all the people behind me. And we have like another a close up shot and I think Galadriel noticed something. And this might be a connection to Osse or so. Um, that in the background, like, oh, this shot is hard to see. Like in the background, I think the sea monster um, disappears again uh, in, in the background or so. No, it's not a sea monster, I'm wrong. It is Halbrand going into her direction. Oh, you don't see it here, right? Now we see it. Halbrand is coming closer, so that is that's what his shot was. Okay, I remember now. And then uh, Halbrand basically... Um, so there's a second rift, and for whatever reason, Halbrand survived, but uh, no, no, nobody else, which is kind of... Unusual already. But yeah, it's... Uh, oops. It's really... A lot of stuff happening here in the ocean scene. So this is how it is. And then they get together on the on the boat. And have this um, intense conversation. Like Halbrand now helps Galadriel up again on the boat. Which is interesting that he does this. He also has his chest there on the boat. Not sure what's in, in it. And Halbrand also has like um, something like a, a necklace or something uh, with him. And people wonder what is in it. I have no idea yet. And then Galadriel is now um, drinking. So Halbrand managed to save all the supplies, the drinking thing and had an as an intact raft and it was not killed by by the sea monster and the sea monster just went further just killed off all the others like on top of that galadriel was in the ocean on her way to 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 the west continent somewhere here and then finds people there somewhere like it just makes absolutely no sense in my opinion 
and then she finds other people, humans on a boat. Like there's so many weird circumstances that have to align perfectly that it feels too unplausible uh, in my book. <laughs> it's Hal Halbrand is a sea monster. That's probably the best explanation. It's just, yeah, I don't know. Um, I like the filming and the cinematography and how this is acted out, but just from the context, it seems really off for me. Like, I'm not the hugest fan of this particular scene here. Yeah, definitely, like, if you would survive something like this, it has to be the grace of Ulmo, in a way, or of Osse and Uinen or so. But it, it just from from the context um, makes very 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 little sense. Um, have you s uh, reflective rambling? Have you seen the two episodes yet of the um, Rings of Power show? If so, how did you like them? Just curious. Yeah, and now. They even, you know, even has um, oars, I think is the English word for it, and a sail, and some supplies, <laughs> and a raft. <laughs> Just, I really like the raft, though, I have to admit. And it gets even weirder. Yeah, it gets even weirder. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> However, this is the last shot of this particular scene here. Now we go back to the rock smashing contest um, with the dwarves. With Elrond here and it's his turn. And they are smashing rocks for hours. Uh, Sereng Yoshi says, um, most of the Galadriel stuff has been made for me, but uh, really liked uh, most of the, or meh, I'm not sure how you pronounce it actually, but I would say it. It's meh. <laughs> I think that is how you say it, right? Um, really like most of the other plots, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of the same boat. On one way, I think the actress of Galadriel is, uh, of Galadriel is really good. Like, it's not her fault, but I think her story is just strangely written, if that makes sense. It's a cute fish dragon, yeah. I finished up episode 2 tonight. I'm not as well versed in the law um, as most of you, but as a show, I enjoyed it. Uh, I'm still uh, slightly worried that um, they are tracking too many storylines, yeah. Or tackling, not tracking. <laughs> tackling too many storylines. I agree with it. It could be maybe a bit much. But I assume the two first two episodes were very busy when it comes to um, how they were composed. Like, they have to set up so many things. When I do law videos, I always also struggle. When I have to explain first age stuff, it just it's, it's such a long chain added to the first age because everything is connected and there are so many important details to that. It's always difficult to shortly explain this and so I can kind of feel their pain to just set everything up there. Like, I don't know how it is, for example, in uh, House of the Dragon. Um, I assume they probably because they can assume that a lot of people have seen um, um, Game of Thrones that they maybe can, even though it plays before it, but some like you, you probably people know how the world kind of works and coming from lord of the rings to this show 20 years later that is also different in many ways and plays still in middle earth but a very different middle earth i feel like um it works yeah, you, are, you are right remember episode one of game of thrones i think that's one of the few game of thrones episodes i've actually seen but yeah you might be right there
Mm, I feel also like she got a bit more comfortable with um, the role as the episodes progressed, um, even if things are generally filmed in or filmed in order. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They don't have such a broad timeline and right issues. Like, I feel often that um, not having rights to the Silmarillion and other stuff is definitely holding the show back at least a little bit, if that makes sense. Like, they could... Some stuff they can't portray, let's say, correctly, because they re the show indicates, yeah, we can reference this and we would f really like to show you more about this, but we can't because of rights. I think they uh, needed a way of, of her to somehow reach Numenor. Yeah, that is exactly what I also think. Like, they they wanted Galadriel in Numenor. How do we get her there? And I think they could have done this more elegantly than this. Like, I feel it, it seems very strange, the whole Galadriel plot. I, I like the actor, and in, de in details, I like it. I like the actors, for example, and the settings, the cinematography, but the overall, simply the plot and the setup it's really strange for me. Like, I'm also not the biggest fan of that yet. Uh, we are past the raft yet. Yeah, we are. We are now at the rock smashing contest. And now we can discuss the big question of the rock uh, smashing contest is which, let me just get the, the correct map here because we are now back in Moria which is on the map here, very far away from Galadriel. Probably didn't hit the arrow correctly, but roundabout. And in the rock smashing contest, um, yeah, they smash a lot of rocks. The question is now, does Elrond lose on purpose or not? Like, I think there are two possibilities. Elrond had enough strength to, to um, destroy one of these rock left, and he did it, but the axe broke, and then he had to get enough strength for another hit and he, he, there was not enough left. And if you look at Durin's expression, you also definitely notice that um, Durin is also kind of at his limit already. And um, because I think there's like a, sm a small side of relief in his face when he um, when Elrond gives up, basically. So um, that is a possibility. Or Elrond has planned everything like this and he knows... Um, he he should not defeat an angry Durin and um, should maybe lose like the the plan Elrond might have might have focused is lose to him and then use his diplomacy to apologize and like if somebody wins a competition he's usually in a better mood as when he would lose it especially a dwarf and um, a stubborn dwarf so I don't know I, I think it's um, a very interesting scene here. Yeah, I, th I also agree with, um, like, I also think he might have lost on purpose as well. This was also a thought I had. Uh, did his hammer break because um, he misses the rock? We can maybe look at this frame by frame in a moment. I honestly um, think he gave up maybe for Durin's honor. Yeah, exactly. That's also what I think. Um, I think that's most plaus plausibly. Like, um, in a way... If, if let's say El, let's say Elrond would have won, that's why I think the the theory of him giving up on purpose, like losing on purpose, is the most plausible. He would have won the boon. You know what I mean? He would have won the the boon, the thing from the dwarves. He could ask them maybe a favor or something. And then after this favor is gone, he is it's also still gone. But in in losing, he gains. Uh, regains the friendship of Durin again and can mend their relationship if that makes sense. So from my perspective it would be really smart here to lose even though 
it would be a risky gamble here by Elrond, but it sh just shows um, how good he is at um, the stuff he does. So, <laughs> as he said himself, let me work my craft here. The dwarves have less uh, stamina, uh, yeah, potentially. History of um, House of the Dra Dragon history is clearly set too. The source material didn't have a dialogue either, so the writers had um, have a lot more away as well. Yeah, okay. I haven't looked into House of Dragons yet. I heard. Is it true that you can watch the first two House of Dragon episodes for free on YouTube? Let's say, uh, Rusty has also a really good point. Breaking the hammer is tougher than breaking the rocks. Elrond proves a higher thing by breaking the hammer. Now that is a that is a good point too. I think it's also like dwarves like a good competition, and Elrond gave them a good competition. It was not like he um, like they, they had to punch through a lot of rocks to get to this point even. Uh, okay, Lavis, um, uh, <laughs> would love to stay longer, but uh, work um, in the AM. Yeah, I wish you much uh, sl good rest, sleep well, and much fun on your work, and see you soon. There will be more streams coming up in the upcoming days for sure. Thank you for um, staying here a while and um, join the chat. Much appreciated, Reflective Rambling. Yeah, that's also a possibility. Let me just um, we we'll watch into this in a moment. Like I would just play the scene, but I can't sadly. And just continue smashing the rocks, rock after rock. I like how the 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 guard is also sitting there. They they're not even the dwarves aren't even standing anymore. And Shumi, they're already sitting down at, in parts, and one one dwarf is already asleep from all the rocks they are hitting there. <laughs> okay, here comes the um. Here comes the um. Uh, try to find the frame. You are right. I think. It, it, you you you, are, you seem to be right. Like, look at this. This is the frame Elrond hits hits the rock. He doesn't hit the rock with the axe, but he hits the rock with um the not the pickaxe part. You know the what is it, what is it called? Elrond ultimate diplomat. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, it's really, pretty interesting. Yeah, I thought he maybe, yeah. So Joe might be right. He missed um, the handle as a word, I think, right? He hit the handle onto the rock. And then if I go into the next frame, okay, the next frame is not working. Oh, now it worked.
it uh, yeah it seems to break very interesting observation there Oh, the amazing um, bad boy says, just watched the second episode again right through uh, and I've warmed to it even more. Awesome. Shaft, probably also a word. Handle, shaft, I don't know. He actually uh, missed the rock with the hammer and snapped the shaft, yeah. So I think that was then a very deliberate move by, by Elrond. So we just discussed this here. If you look at this. Pretty cool. Yeah, I also think that he might have done this then on purpose. I like how this one dwarf is was was sleeping already, <laughs> and uh, then he just wakes up. And yeah, this this dwarf has um, a spare axe with him. Pretty interesting. I always have to switch to the map again in case people wonder to, to just see the next scene. There's one scene I would like to look a bit longer into. And yeah, something is written on the X. Oh, that's the wrong scene chat. This one here. There's a weird diff thong here. What could this mean, Chad? I, I need to write this down. So it depends on in what it is written. Like this, it should be in the Moria mode, but we discussed previously that it's not necessarily um, the Moria mode. So the first letter is an is an I, then the second one is an N or an R. Then followed by an O. Right? Yeah, that's an O, I think. If I'm not overlooking something. And then it follows by the um what's that letter again? The Just too tired to find the letter. It's not the um 
Oh, I'm stupid, maybe. No. For a moment, I, have, I was shocked, but I, I think I'm not stupid. Okay, that's good. What was this one letter? Was this the N or the NG? I think it was. It would mean iron. Ironing. Ow. Ironing our. Oh, I, I get it. Iron ironing our hand. It. I think says. Did somebody read it faster than me? Probably not. Oh, I went. Uh, I went. Took a full exercise run, showered, made a two course, uh, <laughs> made a two course dinner, and you are still streaming. You are a hero. <laughs> Thank you, Bilbo. <laughs> Do not smash handle into rocks. Okay, yeah, that could also be, but um, yeah, I'm. So this this is an let me just go through this again. So this is an I. Let me just Oh no, I'm an idiot. Okay, okay, okay. This must be the uh, So for, for people wondering, this is Kirs. Kirs also known as dwarven runes, but it's an origin and elven um writing system. Also, thank you for the gift, Bilbo Baggings. Much, much appreciated for gifting the memberships. I would almost say, can I have some cheese in the chat for that? Like, we have this awesome cheese. <laughs> I made this um, cheese unicorn uh, emoticon at times. I, I really like it. Because I, so when I play video games, I sometimes cheese stuff. So, <laughs> as I always say, can I have some cheese in the chat? It's always fun. But yeah, much appreciated, Bilbo. Thank you. But let us conti continue to um, the, the Kears alphabet. I said the dwarves, uh, I think Dairon um, from from uh, Dorias de developed the system. The dwarves adapted it because the dwarves worked with Dorias some time um, together. And um, they really liked the system because it's easy to carve into metal and stone, as I said. In, in contrast to, for example, Tengwar with these fine round lines. And um, they're different... They're not called modes, but the alphabet was changed depending on the needs. And Tolkien gives us two um, alf two versions of it in the Lord of the Rings. One is called um, one is the older Angerthas, and one is the Angerthas Moria. And Angerthas Moria is um, um this, the, uh, yeah the, the second one. So now I got it. There's also um, Angerthas Erebor. But um, Erebor doesn't, it's not a dwarven place, most likely yet in the second age. There is an indication that dwarves were in Erebor before, but it's not the Erebor we know. And yeah, so when it comes to this letter now, so this is an E. In Angersas Moria, uh, this is an R, basically could call it a different mode, like in, the, like in Tengwar. This here is the um, consonant O. This here, I'm not 100% sure what it means. Let me just see, where is it? Yeah, this is an N then. Oh, now I get it. So this is, a, this here, the dot, as, as, you see these dots here? Let me just, see these dots here are basically the spaces, if that makes sense. Let me just get the my my cursor here no that's wrong image it's really hard to see no it's not hard to see but i thought these this one dot is a bit bigger than the others 
Like these dots is basically, it it's an, indicates it's a new word. This one here is for whatever reason bigot and I thought it would be maybe just, I don't know, um, um, I don't know, some, some, from from use it appeared like it was a damage in the in the plate with with, with the writing on it. So what it yeah what it then says is, um, ion. Actually, would say iron, uh, but I guess it's it's English, which is not unusual for dwarfs for reasons. Then this is um yeah in. This here is an O like we have I N in O. U, another R. Ah, oh, you can't see it like this. Oh, I'm an idiot. So let's start again. <laughs> I, N, O, N. Iron. P new word. In, I and N. New word. O, U, R. Our. And then this is an H. This is the A. This is another letter I assume for an N. This is, this is a strange writing at the end. This is, I think, the letter for ND, for ND. But for whatever reason, there's another... Oh, this is... An, now I get it. It's not the D, it's the S. This is then the, the S letter, basically. So it means iron in our hands. In case people wonder what is written there. I made it. Yeah, in my mind, I, I, for a moment I thought this was, wasn't this the D letter, it's not the D, this is the S and this is the ND, so iron in our hands. Got it. I just was confused by this dot here and I thought, okay, is this ironing or something? But no. I'm eating second dinner, so happy to share. Awesome. I wish you um oh have a nice meal. Good app uh bon appetit. <laughs> Let me just switch to studio mode back and um move on here further. So we managed even translate something on stream. Awesome. I just want to point out for me it's again six in the morning. So brain power is on the uh is is, is decreasing again. Now I'm able to sleep tonight. Awesome. I think Elrond, though there is a shot. Oh, let me get this. Elrond looks at it, like this, I said, like how this is cut, and it seems like he seems to read what is on the X. Very interesting. Maybe it gives him his, his idea, or maybe he sees something in it and says, Ein in our hands. And yeah, you can definitely see if you look at, at, at him, how he looks at him. Like, um, there's, there's a lot of tension, I feel like, in this scene. I think they act this really well. Like, he doesn't want to lose to Elrond in a way. But he also knows that he can't smash many rocks anymore, it seems. So he's worried that um, Elrond uh, <laughs> might might want to continue. And yeah, Elrond basically also gets to get gets gets his tension, and it almost looks like he wants to hit again. And what he uh, does instead, um, he uh, he pulls down uh, he he puts down the the, the X instead. And now I hope I can get the the face of um, yeah. Like just just look at look at Durin's face. Like that is the mo the most important part of this shot. I just played it here forward for a moment. Look how relieved he looks. It's like he d he gave up finally. <laughs> and yeah, it it's it's in my opinion such an awesome scene as a result. 
this relief in, in his eye uh, in his eyes Elrond giving up putting back the thing I still think he should be able to beat him. Well, he beat Elrond at this game, but I still think um, Elrond definitely um, gave up for a reason. Like, he definitely thinks, yeah. But but just, just to get this expression out of Durin, like, he knows, okay, I have won. I have beat the elf. I'm superior in a way. Um, I, I showed him. in <laughs> Like, he's ang still angry at Elrond. They, of course, know each other. And um, yeah, he's 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 happy about this detail in a way, and now he can negotiate with a much more positive um, Durin, as if he would have beat, maybe defeated Durin for whatever reason. Maybe the the hint iron in our hands is like that iron you can form. It's maybe hard and difficult to form, but you can still form it. And we can form it with our hands. Well, we're using tools to form it, I guess. But you know, my point. Maybe th that is you shouldn't. You shouldn't break it. You should try to form it. Maybe that is what he tries to do here. He Durin is the iron, and he tries to fo to form him now for his di with his diplomacy into um, mending their friendship again. And for that, um, like, in in a way. Elrond loses, but he also has gained the respect kind of of the others for doing this. It was a good competition. The dwarves are all happy in the background with their mugs and cheering. And do, uh, their, their, their prince has won, has defeated the annoying elf from outside. And on top of that, Durin also felt, boy, if, if he would have destroyed this rock, I would be in trouble. He looks like it, at least in the scene. And um, I think... Maybe Elrond would have one swing left there, but he did not, and he also destroyed the axe. Maybe also to show, um, as somebody said, destroying the axe is maybe more difficult than destroying the rock in a way. And um, like he got a new axe and so on. It's, it's a, a lot of interesting details here. Also, the f amazing female um, facial hair uh, was an amazing touch and did not went unnoticed. Yeah, I agree on that. Not all. I, it seems like not all the females have um, facial hair here, but some have definitely. And now, um, yeah, Durin can celebrate. He won the competition, but he's also not that angry anymore at at Elrond. It seems now, now Elrond can work his diplomacy on him. I like how the uh, the one dwarf, um, this one here, is 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 just pu putting his finger on him and, and kind of laughing. Yeah, <laughs> the elf, they can't beat us dwarfs here. <laughs> It would be different if Elrond would have won. Though all, all pretty much know, yeah, it was kind of impressive though. <laughs> There's another interesting detail I just noticed while going through this. You see he has his X here, probably... Um, uh, we we risk it a bit. Like it's a very short scene. He puts the X to the side. See this? And he gives it to somebody. Let me just skip ahead a bit. And he gives it to I, I assume this dwarf here. And he has it. And is really happy that he got the X of the victor or the pickup X of the victor. Like that's a very nice touch in the background of the of the dwarf. Like uh, stuff like this, I really like. 
I think that is why this uh, details like this make the scene feel very uh, like like real, like alive, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. It's also about as uh, Hartley Scott, uh, uh, yeah, Hadley Scott says, um, this whole scene is about Duri not losing face in front of the others. Yeah, exactly. For Elrond losing face, it's not that big of a deal. But I also think like now um, Durin is much more likely to, to talk to him. And I also like how like it, it's really hard to, to, to demonstrate this. But just look, if you have, if you watch it at some point, look how um, Durin goes. Like, um, This is way he goes, like, I don't know, this is very interesting. Maybe it's like, oh boy, I'm really exhausted. Or d does he walk like like a victor or so? Yes, it's, I know, it's very interesting how, how this changed. A lot of detail in this scene, I feel. Also, Elrond is still kneeling, so he's at a lower position than Durin. And he looks up, beautiful cinematography here. So Elrond looks actually smaller than Durin in this scene. Um, so he makes himself smaller, um, and so on and so forth, to be very humble here in this scene, so he goes full diplomacy mode. And now um, he looks at him also like brilliantly played by the actor. And I think that is what, what why people often also like these scenes here, because, I don't know, the, the chemistry between the actors I feel like is really good and Elrond is a really fantastic actor, the actor um, who plays him. Random question. Uh, but after death, what was the fate of the dwarves? Do they go to the halls of Mandos or somewhere else? Is it okay um, if it's too late to uh, uh, to look that up? Um, I can tell you out of my head, the dwarves seem also that... I can't give you the exact quote, but it's indicated that the dwarves also go to the halls of Mandos and then maybe to a separate place from where the elves go though. And then they wait until the end of the world and then Aula gets them out again, and then they start building the rebuilding and f um, f forming the new world. That's basically um, the fate the dwarves believe in. But it seems like they go also to the halls of Mandos. Yeah, that is true. Like if if we look here, look at how um, how Durin looks here. He looks really like his hair. Um, and so on. He, he, he put in some work and effort into this. And um, and Elrond looks like he could go for an like I don't know. He is ready for more. <laughs> we could just continue. Like I, I really like um, this interaction here. And um, then Elro Elrond smartly asks him if he could escort Elrond to the exit. Yeah, exactly. So it's death, waiting, waiting, and then giant game of My uh, Minecraft Arda edition. It's basically that. Yeah, same. When I first saw Elrond, I was also not convinced, but <laughs> I'm completely sold on him. Like, pretty awesome. And then they have this um, this elevator here. Like there's also, let's, let's show, I want to show you the scene here because there's just so much detail here. We have here an elevator there and so on. Here are elevators, all the lights and I don't know, here's some some reels going on. So the, the dwarven craftsmanship is, is really impressive here to see. I, I can of course definitely see how people argue um, that... Uh, 
you know, can definitely see how people might argue that um, elevators, but they even show us to some degree how these elevators might work. Not completely, but in details. Like if you look at this elevator scene, which is also in the trailer, we um, we see like on top you see this dwarven face here, and it's basically yeah, the counterweight, which of course makes sense for an elevator, I guess. But um, just just the detail here, like these. Maybe I can show you like this. Like see these uh, dwarven faces here, just coming down and so on. It's pretty cool. You also see some rocks um, here on this particular scene. Here in the background. Some say the, the height difference between Durin and um, uh, and Elrond should be bigger. Also with this line here on the uh, on the uh, on the front like uh, making like putting Durin more into the front becomes also uh, like more in the background to make him appear smaller doesn't work when you have this here like it seems like they're really standing next to each other i'm not sure how this is filmed maybe they are filmed separately or so um really hard to tell but yeah really interesting maybe it's also on a green screen and uh, really hard to tell how they made this particular shot very curious to seeing the making of material Especially with the rocks in the background, it seems like um, the other actor can't stay. Like on this this close up, you see it better. The other actor can't stay far enough in the background for this to be a perspective thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't. Under I also don't understand the costume complaints and the set. I I can understand because the style is differently com compared to, for example, Peter Jackson stuff, and some of it looks very clean. But I have to see the the dwarven stuff. I I'm totally on board with. So far, I really like that, like the set and the background and the costumes and so. And this in this section were absolutely beautiful, for me personally. Yeah, that is true. Also, today's elevators are nothing but counterweights and so on. Yeah, that's true. Also, you have these massive chains here in the background, which is interesting to see. Like, it's kind of feels fitting. I feel like now that I've seen Moria, it doesn't feel out of place. And then they have this discussion here and so on. The height difference again, also well done. Very interesting. Um, like, and, and Elrond... Um, basically uh, tries to work on this relationship and so on and he has to be very careful and what he says and you definitely notice that um maybe durin tells him you weren't here for 20 years and durin even says himself for an elf that's probably i don't know like a few seconds but for for a dwarf that is basically like a lifetime in a way almost not a lifetime but a big part of his lifetime a noticeable part noticeable part of his lifetime yeah, nothing um, in the show has been jarring enough to pull me out of the fantasy so no complaints to uh, on sets music um, costumes or even CGI nothing as bad as uh, the third Hobbit movie at all yeah that's true like the Hobbit movies looked worse especially the cgi orcs and so on that's much much better in this show yeah i think uh, i agree with um uh, also with spielkarp here that it the difference of time perception and what what time means is completely different from from an elf and elrond of course is a half elven so he maybe understands it a bit better but um but also not 
And also, yeah, this color here says um, um, Durin Deathless, in case people wonder. Here in this scene, I'm not like, w w I, I don't have a good theory for this, but we see this bird here carved into the stone. Also pretty impressive, like this is pretty high up, you know, and just carving this is, is kind of impressive looking. Maybe what the bird means, because we know um, that some of the eagles lived also in the Misty Mountain of the Great Eagle. So maybe this is one of the Great Eagles or so just as a as a reference for the dwarves. Probably they knew about these great eagles and uh, maybe respected them or thought, okay, these are also, I mean, the great eagles are basically um, like, like associated to Manwe, the king of the world himself. And so I guess um, also the great eagles would be respected by the dwarves in a way. Nice video, but I must uh, sleep now. Yeah, sleep well. Like I can't believe how late it is already. <laughs> Hypocritical because of the reincarnation. It might be solved differently in the show. And I don't know, also like how, how, the, how Elrond plays this, like he looks really, dis he understands now when, when um, Durin tells him all that, look at his face, he, he, he understands it, he feels for him. And it makes, like they, they play this so well in my opinion, both of them. Like he has compassion for it, he understands why he's angry at him. And um, <laughs> in his diplomatic Elrond way, um, yeah, he can't, I also really like that, um, that he now, even though it's late, he still basically makes clear that um, he still has well wish, like he wishes him well and congratulates him on his wife, on his children, and so on, and um, to say to basically express, yeah, I, I, I totally, I'm so happy for you that it is, but, and I'm sorry that um, I missed all of that, but of course, from his perspective, um, this. It's just such a, I don't know, a small time. Like he's even surprised that how the, how this place has changed. And then um, he even brings him um, home and makes it clear he shouldn't stay too long. And then, um, yeah, an interesting <laughs> other thing oh, happens. Um, it is, um, yeah, Disa appears and she, in this, in this um, constellation of these three characters, she basically is like in the middle of them like um Durin is angry Elrond is seeking to mend the friendship and she's the connecting part of it because she's not angry at Elrond at all and I don't know this has such a beautiful chemistry here uh, this scene for me there we have it she also plays it brilliantly and <laughs> she's also like a very strong female character it feels I know some people don't like to hear it but um she is like both, Durin is a strong character in a way, and she is, and um, like they really have this relationship, but they can also easily clash, and um, both are probably equally stubborn in a way. <laughs> It's like an intelligent dog to a human. Um, to a human, the human must appear as an as an angel or god for the dog, as the human barely ages during the dog's time. Uh, probably. So yeah, Disa worked out pretty well for me. They had a beautiful chemistry.
I really like this um, Disa Hux Elrond scene. I don't know why, but I, I, I think it's kind of adorable in a way. Also, look at the look at this at at at, at the um, scene composition, like where the characters stand, like they are close to each other, but he stands further in the background, away to the side, um, like how he is. Like cinematography and directing wise, it's really really cool shot in my opinion. Really cool scene. Of course, there are in in the history. I think in, it's called blocking the um, art of placing actors on a stage, and uh, Akira Kurosawa was, for example, um, um, a, an absolute master in this. Like he composed very complex scenes with like masterful blocking that impresses um, to this day. Um, this is definitely not that. And yeah, you notice, for example, now the actor, like in the next scene, the actor comes now close, like Durin comes closer and closer to the two of them. It's just, just um, really well done. <laughs> this shot is also kind of cute when the children appear with the, um, <laughs> get out of my head. <laughs> it's a weird scene, but it's kind of funny. I like that. So much cool stuff in this. Um, question chat. Is this a reference to the dragon helmet of Dorlumin again? Maybe? Pretty cool. <laughs> it was so cool. Yeah, mini <laughs> mini dwarfs, if you want to call them <laughs> like that. Yeah, Elrond is much gentler um, to Durin after he realizes how much the friendship means to Durin and the time lap. Yeah, yeah exactly. Husband, go have friends. I <laughs> love how she teases him, um, how long it took for her. I think the scene was out of context. This scene I felt like um, didn't really work in the in this promo material we have seen. But also, um, yeah, you now notice that Durin is again a bit closer and so on. But now Elrond is not in the scene. So he's pretty close. So you see his here in this yeah, in this shot. You see he's standing there. Now she's in between, like the connecting factor with the children between um, both of them. So very interesting scene composition here. Uh, then Elrond notices that the tree grows down here. Also very interesting, even though this might be against the book law because the Malorn trees would just grow in Galadriel's um, place, nowhere else. But um, the, I would say this little law in accuracy, or maybe you could argue that it's unrealistic that a tree like this would grow there. It's not even, they don't call it Malorn tree though. Um, I think they... Um, try to not do this but Elrond makes a very powerful point in my opinion and he um, says basically that um, where where love is it can't be dark and then he says something like it so it's no wonder that in a home of yours where this love is that this tree can also uh, grow you could say it's maybe a bit cheesy but um, how he expresses it and puts it into a relationship uh, into this yeah, construct of their relationship and their, their mending and so on. I found that a really powerful line that definitely stuck out.
Yeah, this this point he's still at the apologizing to Disa um, part, and he just tries to stay longer and longer, and now he's sitting there. And um, yeah, they they talk to each other. They have this dialogue where they talk about the um, singing to the stones and finding what is going on. He says it's a beautiful tradition. And before that, I think they also, or yeah, they talked about um, or after that how she how how the two met and how um, Durin was basically always lurking when um, at, at the expedition and he always came back and uh, every week or so and it took him like. Um, three weeks to two or five weeks uh, he says like two weeks and she says five weeks and i don't know but yeah it's it's a funny scene and also scene composition again like we we see um we see now elrond these are still in the middle connecting talking to him and he also sits Clo but he's now much much closer to Elrond in the scene in the in the scene composition like we went from let me just see like we went from um went from this shot here <laughs> to basically um uh this shot here like it is just uh a very cool transition like this is part I really uh, liked I have to admit it's a lot of fun analyzing it and looking um, much closer at it and after they have like a lot of talk and about all this explanation like also the 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 uh, the acting is really uh, it's definitely um <laughs> it's definitely there like they have a very good chemistry also like that on his he has gold on his um, elbow and so on. So very interesting to see some of the details. We have seen this on the posters as well. And the interesting part now is they talk about the tree and um, Disa also tells him that um, and that, that um, uh, Durin also tended the tree like it was his own child and so on. Like so it definitely shows how important this relationship to Elrond was for Durin the Fourth. And um yeah, Elrond realizes this and he just wanted to apologize and so on, but he plays it very, very well, in my opinion. <laughs> he stands up and basically says, um Yeah, um, I want uh, I apologize, I would uh, I would now to leave now. And Disa said, "No, you you can, you can stay." And then Durin says, "Yeah, come on, you can stay." And he still insists, "Yeah, I assure, I don't want to disturb," and so on. And um, like I think he asks him three times, and even is on his way out to just make Durin snap and say, "Okay, dude, you don't know, stay here." Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's such an it's really awesome scene in my opinion. Definitely the highlight of this episode. I would almost say. It's a great shot showing how much bigger he is. Yeah, and then um, Durin says, "Stay here with us," and all the stuff from before is forgotten. Disa also um, likes this and looks at him. Here we also see the sideburns of Disa, so um, I like that um, as well. But yeah, this shot definitely shows like the size difference also pretty well. I agree on that. He looks huge there, yeah. Exactly. It's it's close to cheesiness, but I think um it worked out. Like it it did not cross the line and for this setup which is also much more lighthearted i feel like um the these these scenes here 
and it, it, it worked kind of well. And Elrond has this, the actor is really well portraying this, like he has this calm voice that is also somewhat charismatic and so on. Like he, you definitely see the, the, pol the diplomatic power in Elrond. Very interesting to see. I, I love that they were daring enough to give her facial hair. Yeah. Yeah, love creates its own light. Well said, um, Hadley Scott. Let me just look up this, I think. But yeah, maybe some people saw this scene a bit as too much and maybe it crosses the line for them. But for me, the scenes really worked well. It's kind of, um, yeah, I definitely liked it. Yeah, his love of the uh, tree shows his love for Elrond. Exactly. So, um, yeah, are we getting close to the end? No. <laughs> oh no, Chad, we still have quite a bit left. I, I could swear, shouldn't we be close to the end by now? Yeah, everyone saved the scene in the way that um, he reacted uh, to this family, how he asked three times and so on. Yeah, Elrond basically plays with uh, Durin by making him insist that he stays. <laughs> Elrond knows he's in, exactly. What was the glowing box at the end? Um, I assume it's Mithril. But I only know this from... T uh, my assumption is based on knowing some of the trailers. So the question was um, skipping ahead, but what was um, what was in that glowing box at the end of the Durin scene? First episode stream took 5.5 .5 hours. We are also getting close into the five hour stream, but I almost felt like we should be close to the end. So the next scene, we are now back in the ocean with Galadriel and Halbrand. So that was I don't know where they are exactly. I, I assume they're getting close to Numinor. Don't ask me where they are exactly. That makes very little. Um, it's very hard to track where they um, where they go. Oh yeah, I forgot. There's still the drowning scene, right? The the, the drowning scene is coming the stone water scene here on okay now we have time to analyze this um, little picture here a bit we see Galadriel and she looks at Halbrand and he has this little whatever you call it let me see if I zoom in closer does somebody recognize what this symbol is can sharpen it a little bit. That's all I have. Like I, I'm, I'm waiting for chat answering this because I have no idea. It looked like a winged demon or something. Maybe it's a bird. Like this here, this part here looks like wings, or maybe it are these are ears. I don't recognize it to be honest. Yeah, 
Yeah, the doors of Durin aren't even yet made. Uh, aren't even made yet. Yeah, I was appointed. Um, Galadriel didn't meet Ulmo out in the sea. Uh, he was fond of interacting with mortals more than other Valar. Of course, Galadriel is immortal, but I guess it would also include elves in a way. He com also communicated with Voronwe. And he, I think he said to Voronwe that um, there would um, a tour would come and he should guide him to um, Gondolin. Uh, did the show imply that they had a Silmaril? That's an interesting, like, that is why you ask of the um, box, right, um, at the end. Maybe this, let, let's keep this short. We discuss this when we discuss the box later. I hope you are then still there. But it's a complicated topic. I don't think it's a Silmaril, though. <laughs> it would have been nice if Ulmo chucked her closer to the shore, too. Yeah, maybe he did and we didn't notice. Uh, though I think Ulmo is is Ulmo mentioned in the Lord of the Rings? Let's maybe s search my uh, no. He's n I think it's not mentioned. I at least uh, I just searched my I have a digital version of Lord of the Rings. I can search in it, so it helps a lot. Like yeah, I, I I have no idea what this is. I assume something though is inside is inside. I mean, in a way, we somebody discussed already that um, uh, this boy in 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 the Southlands in Tir Harat mentioned if the true king returns or so. Maybe this is a symbol of the king or so. Very hard to tell. Like just just as a theory. Just imagine this here would be the hat. And I don't want to start the discussion with the wings, but could this be a Balrog? Or like a winged demon or something? Maybe a dragon? Maybe it's a dragon? I don't know what this part here shall be. It's really strange. Maybe this is a, is a man, a king, and this is a crown. Oh no, maybe this is the wing, this is a bird. Maybe this is somebody flying on a bird. You know what I mean? Like on a great eagle or something. Or Sauron, um, future Futuras. Connected to Manuel? Maybe. At the end, it turns out Halbrand is Gandalf. <laughs> that would be like <laughs> the stranger Sauron, Halbrand is Gandalf. That would be funny. Maybe it is the Witch King on his winged steed. Also a possibility. Like, I'm not 100% sure. Like, this here looks like a crown. Like, it looks like the Witch King. It's flying on, I don't know, whatever creature. <laughs> Maybe it's just a bird. Wings plus crown makes me think of uh, a wind and, and so Manwe. Yeah, also a possibility. Maybe there is a relation to Manwe here. We know that um, Gandalf was a, va a, a Maya of uh, Manwe. So I don't think he's Gandalf, to be honest, but... Very interesting. The Witch King in the back. Yeah, maybe. That, that is where the Witch King is stored. 
but yeah i i don't know um exactly what this is but i really found it um quite interesting i have to admit But yeah, so it seems like chat also has no good um, explanation for what that is, but it's definitely um, very noticeable. Like now they are talking about the past and some other details here on the boat. I forgot what exactly the dialogue was. He also has something in his hand. I don't know, maybe a knife or a tool or whatever. No, it's nothing in his hand. It's just the background. I think he, the box is cut off. Hard to tell. Looks like he holds something in his hand, but no, the hand is not, it's not closed. So it's just the ocean or the, the like something where it's behind his leg. Okay. Just looked like that. Um, yeah, and look at look how he looks at him. Like you, you look at him, and you definitely feel something is wrong with that guy. Like it, it's really strange. Yeah, that's also what I could uh, kind of see. Like, I see a figure riding a huge bird-type creature flying um, straight towards us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he isn't happy with an elf there. <laughs> I think he's evil. Yeah, that's probably um, the, the best call for this um, particular scene. Like, they have a conversation. I don't remember. It's too long ago that I've seen the, this, that I remember the exact words there. And yeah, they basically talk quite a bit. And Galadriel basically says that she, with an army she can help her. Well, like she, Galadriel senses in the scene in this dialogue that he maybe knows where the enemy is, and um, she, he, he could maybe lead him. He just needs to know where where he's from, and he just says, um, "Yeah, let 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 the armies to me." And then we see like in the last scene of this. Um, particular part that the the storm is at the horizon like i assume they go they go basically to numinor there their um friendship maybe gets a bit better and um halbrand maybe trusts galadriel or whatever and then they go back to middle earth with the numinorians after galadriel convinced the numinorians to help her in her cause and um then they go to mordor interestingly and I don't know, fight against the orcs there, and um, tr she tries to find more traces of uh, Sauron as a result. I just got here. Did we discuss the fish dragon yet? Yeah, the fish dragon uh, we uh, discussed a bit. Also, welcome. Nice you found your way. The the fish dragon, do I have still copy pasted that? That's a poem of Tolkien called um, uh, Fastito Kalon, uh, however it's pronounced, and um, I have really no idea how it pronounces if you anglicize the name. I wouldn't even be sure how to pronounce it in German, <laughs> just there's a lot of uh, um, vowels in it. Where would ever be the stress in this word? However, maybe that's a reference for it, maybe it's like some other thing i think it might the the sea monster the, the the fish the fish dragon whatever is maybe angry was angry at them because it was like had a spear inside his back interestingly now like the the boat was destroyed a lot of people probably now dead halbrand somehow survived miraculously by just separating the boat and after that Galadriel and Halbrand were just off on this boat and the sea monster didn't attack them ever again. Like, that feels so strange to me. Like, one would think that, I don't know, Galadriel was, of course, luring the fish monster to them, but it seems like um, the fish, the sea monster attacked, um, ju just attacked the others in almost in a way. Like, really, really strange. This section here I'm not the hugest fan of, I have to admit. 
And then we got um, another scene switch. Um, I should not play it here, by the way. <laughs> And yeah, then we are, um, yeah, we have still the orc fight scene. So we, we switch back to Tir Harad, which is on the map somewhere else, which is in Mordor actually. And it is around here in this region. And yeah, she's running back to her village and tries to warn the people because it's a long time ago, but, um, there we notice that Bronwyn and Arondia found this um, place, this this village, and was like burning and attacked. But no, no dead, not no corpses were there. All the the villagers were gone, probably kidnapped, and the um, the animals were dead. And now she returns and um, talks about this this threat. What is interesting of the in in this next um, Harad scene is that we got like. With all the explanation we have gotten so far, we have some some of the ruins now closer. Like we see this here. This could be seen as some kind of fish monster or so. But as said, Morgos most likely have no, not really many um, allies in the water. So unusual. And we also have um, yeah this here, so this is like I don't know. It doesn't look like a dragon. It looks more like a bird. And he's like eating a person. And these persons here um, throw spears at the bird. It could be a dragon, because you could maybe argue these. These are scales or so, but I think it's it's like a great eagle or something. And maybe they, uh, the people who once lived here, saw those as as, as their enemies. Really hard to hard to tell. But in in context of this great eagle here that we see, if we let me just um, skip back to the Halbrand scene we just discussed. This one here. I mean, it's not the same, but as said, this is maybe the head of the bird. This is a person riding on the bird. These are the wings of the bird. Maybe it has to do, maybe this is like the reference we are looking for. It looks like an eagle to me, yeah. Not a fish dragon. Yeah. I said when it comes to um, canon, it's just the the poem in Adventures of Tom Bombadil. How canon that is inside. Like it's a canon book because Tolkien himself during his lifetime published it, but the texts are more Hobbit folklore, if, if that makes sense. So how to how the relationship to the other law is is difficult to say. How do how do the hobbits know about the sea monsters and so on? It's difficult to tell. It's these texts are more mythological poems in 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 this context, I would say, than like a historical record in comparison. That compare, of course, the his um, the law of the elves is also mythological, but I feel like in a different way. Um, they uh, they did say all the men fought for Morgos, so maybe it's like some ancient sort of anti-elf eagle 
good type thing. Maybe it's propaganda against the eagles and the forces of good in a way. And they say, yeah, these eagles come and eat you all the time. And this is basically supposed, and it's like this look, the, the character here looks, or the depiction looks like a female, I assume. I don't know why I get, like, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it looks like it's a dress that she's wearing. So basically the terrible eagles come to you and eat your women or something like that. Yeah, exactly. There was a shot between um, uh, in the first. Oh, you, you can't see the women, right? This one here. Uh, let me just look up the other scene from the beginning. There's a scene where we see the eagles actually fight against um, fell beast. It looked, or maybe some sort of dragons. This scene here, found it, just took a moment. Very interesting scene. Just was absorbed in thought for a moment. Uh, they don't win um, them all. Mm -hmm. Ah, now I get it. It's about the your your profile picture or something, right? I just was confused. Who does not look like who at all? Generally um, speaking, I don't know how to define canon for Tolkien at all. Yeah, that is a complicated topic. Everything has published, everything he wrote later. Complicated topic. I have a video about canon in Tolkien's universe where it basically says maybe there is no canon. Feathers burn. Um, he got hit by a dragon. So yeah, um, let me just switch back to the other scene. And yeah, Bronwyn just um, gets to the um, to the tavern, I call it. And here we uh, we see a lot of people. Um, I really like how, how some of these characters that standing there look like. Sometimes you get the, the feeling of you are in Brie in The Prancing Pony. Like it, it's a different vibe, but it has something distantly similar. The proto Prancing Pony, it is. Interesting detail there in the back. Curious about that now. Like at the fireplace, you also have like a face here carved in. Never noticed that, but 
can't tell you what the meaning of it is, but it's interesting that it's there. So yeah, I'm uh, definitely running out of steam slowly here. Oh, I shouldn't play, uh, press play here. So basically they talk to each other and um, she doesn't have any, uh, Bronwyn does not have true evidence, so nobody really believes her. And um, she's angry, of course, about this and goes home. And at home, Theo is, of course, alone. And he looks um, fascinated into the fire. Like, it definitely feels like, um, I don't know, something is going on in his mind. The thought has really... is, is laying on him. It's, it's, it, I didn't expect that Theo, there would be so much... He would feel, like, so in a way so dark. You know what I mean? Like, he also seems very angry and then he hears something and then he starts um, hitting the ground with, with this fire making th stick thing that makes sense. Like, he, he suddenly explodes and just with, with so much anger and tries to tries to smash the ground here. Like, I, I found this a really interesting scene. Maybe the the sword already has putting some something dark over him that he is so angry here. Still, um, a very interesting scene. And then, yeah, I really like the shot where he uh, basically uh, looks. If you can see any of the mice, I like the cinematography again. So it's basically how you would shot it, uh, shoot it, I guess. He looks through the through the hole in this scene, and then um, the hole looks back at him, which I find very funny. Like first, um, and he looks from above. And yeah, now the hole looks back at him. It's almost it's almost scary, right? It's almost like I wouldn't say called a horror film, but uh, definitely a creepy scene in a way. Like you look, you think there are some mice, and yeah, I don't know. It's <laughs> suddenly it's a very big mice looking at you. Also, the eyes reflect the light a bit. I feel so it seems a bit like the orcs definitely have that, and then. The next scene we see um, Arondia um, sneaking through those um, very tiny tunnels here with a, with a little lantern. And um, yeah, on, in the tunnel then he finds like a claw and I don't know what. It, uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a fingernail or something. But uh, something is sticking in the rock, and he sees um, marks from the from the claws, and then I guess he can notice. Oh no, that really looks like orcs or something. Yeah, uh, don't worry, uh, Figo. It um, a fish dragon. I don't re really remember, but. I only remember this poem, which is written by Tolkien and even published by himself during his lifetime, very late in the 60s. So one could say it could be completely canon. Not sure if they have the rights for this or if it was exactly what they are um, referencing here, but yeah, maybe. Let me just see what the next scenes are. Yeah, we have more tunnel action, and um, yeah, he noticed that um, he, he sees like a shadow there. Of a claw, I, I really like how they play here. Almost, 
Nosferatu, of course, looked different, but there you also had like the shadow of his hand at the wall in the film from 1922, from uh, uh, I think what was his name, Friedrich Wilhelm Murnau. And yeah, um, here you see the sh the shadow. I can make it move a little bit. And he knows, uh oh, they are behind me. And then he has to escape and crawl through this very narrow thing. And yeah, it's kind of, it's almost cute. This little um, rat or um, just jumps. I think it's a rat jumps over his arm. Look at this. <laughs> kind of cute. Yeah, it's an Adventures of Tom Bombay just found it, exactly. <laughs> Marks from the other side. But yeah, it's a, it's a very narrow space he has to get through and the reds behind him and so on. And then he somehow um, Uh, falls down into th this water pond here when he reaches the other side. And yeah, then we have the scene we know from the trailers. So now he swims through this pond. He's underwater for a moment. Um, somewhere, I don't know, deep. Let me just see if I've ever underwater scene here as well. There's not much to see here, but it's um, still pretty well filmed, in my opinion. And he climbs out of the water and looks... Ah, I missed the, sh I missed the scene, sadly. Stands there with his armor and waits that maybe some orc follows him through the water. He has his dagger drawn and then only... Um, yeah, I don't know. Some, what do you call it? bubbles just um, emerge from the water. It's a really tense moment because he uh, kind of expects to be attacked from the front. Yeah, I found finally a bubble. <laughs> and yeah, then we have the scene from the, that we know from the trailer. And yeah, it's almost like a little creepy horror scene. Suddenly, these hand emerge from behind and just grab him. And um, yeah, then he's gone. And we switch back to Bronwyn, who um, uh, is now walks to her to her home and sees that somebody was there and somebody um searched there and yeah her son Theo just is hiding um and he basically says yeah I'm safe here just call help just trying to find the scene here yeah? She also notices this hole in her ground. And because we already established the hole in the other village, we know what she knows what this means. So, I don't know, a really cool shot that explains what's going on, what she realizes. Some, some beautiful shots here, as always, through the hole, looking at her surprised face. That it's the, the enemy's already here. And now she knows, okay, I, I really have to convince them. And yeah, I, I also speculated um, about this, this shot there at the door. You see also some marks of claws here at the wall. So um, very interesting.
and yeah, Theo is in it. And then they talk, and it says, run, get help or anything. And um, instead of running, um, Bronwyn decides, like, instead of running, um, she decides to also hide. Maybe she hears something. I can't really tell you why she makes this decision. Maybe it's like, okay, I can't leave my son here alone with the orc and just run away and get help. And when you, when we're back, who knows what has happened. So in, in a maybe ir irrational moment, she decides to stay there and uh, hide as well. In this closet. And then we have the scene from the trailer. Um, that we already know like the claw comes out here of this um of the ground and um emerges again this is really an osferatu shot we also see here this mark of the claw but maybe this is not the door where bronwyn hides but it's the thing where theo hides and it's um, much much smaller so it's relatively close it's not really a big door in the background very interesting um to now see the, the how the room works. Now, I speculated because we see like um, some hairs in the light, like here in the shot, that he maybe have has already hit somebody. Maybe in the previous village because he definitely fought somebody um, before. So maybe it has to do with this. Maybe also these nails can just regrow from them and just use these claws when they uh, get lost or so. Very interesting. But yeah, we, we speculated it being an orc and this orc looks really terrifying. Like, look at his, look at this face here. Like even his mouth looks uh, very very strange. Like, doesn't look doesn't look too pleasant, uh, to be honest. Like almost really like a monster. A really really spooky thing here. The bubble screenshot. <laughs> this is great stuff, Philosopher Games. Thank you, much appreciated. Yeah, the, the, the scenes are very claustrophobic. I agree. It's like really almost like a little horror esque film uh, become it come, becomes there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. There were already claw marks there. It's it's yeah, a lot of interesting details here. Orc looks definitely scary, and now they also look through like um, I like these shots where the where they look through these cracks in the in the um, what's it called in the closet and in, in the door, and just look and just try to see. But they don't. They have now incomplete information, if you want, of the room, and this just increases the tension. Like they try to see where's the orc, what is he doing. Then we get these creepy angled shots at times, like like at his ears, like this one here. They see what is what is with this? What does he have a helmet on or whatever? Um, they also have these um, yeah, like like a shot like this here. Like you really think, okay, this could be straight out of a horror film, in in a way. Like it's <laughs> it's really interesting. Then yeah, when the when the stuff here gets, he has like the skull of some animal on his head and so on. Really, really scary. And both of them really fear for their life and try to make not a sound uh, at it. Like this adds simply this this tangent. This, extreme tension to it and then in one shot um like I, I like how this is filmed like in one shot um bronwyn sees the orc standing in front of seo's hiding place and then um, in the next uh in the next shot 
basically um suddenly the orc is not standing there anymore and she said oh where did she go she just moved to the side a little bit and moved back to look and um like almost like a natural your natural movement while you are standing and then suddenly he's gone in the next moment think uh oh now with my incomplete information i don't see the orc anymore i don't know what to do and then she panics a bit like i also like how the actors play this pretty well like now Sio looks what's going on. Oh boy, I just went ahead far too much. And now Sio sees that the orc is um uh, close to to the to that window there and he moves this this box here has ju just moved into the into the frame and then in Bronwyn's closet of course something has to happen she shakes it a little bit and then this bo uh, this bottle here starts going down and I think she catches it but uh, the movement of the bottle um, definitely gets the attention of the orc she noticed um, this then in this shot here That's really interesting. Like in this in this shot, you can see it. Maybe if I increase the color a little bit, uh, the color, the do some uh, make it a bit um, brighter. That's oh, a very green shot. Oh, I'm on the wrong. No, it, it's exposure, but you see. It's hard to see here, but um, you basically notice that she is um, she's catching the bottle, basically, so that it doesn't fall down. But doing so, um, the orc notices her and starts tearing down that um, um, tearing down that that thing. She's not not a friend that the orc found her there, and then Theo comes out of his. Um, out of his hiding place because the orc is distracted and attacks it. And then, yeah, the, the fight just starts and they step. We probably don't have to go through every scene here, but I, I still really liked how this t the setup to this is um, is done. And then, yeah, you see Theo jumping up with, I don't know, something in his hand, like, I don't know, scissors or something, and just rams it into the back of this orc. Yeah, it's it's shears or scissors or whatever you call call it in English. Yeah, the orc with his claw manages to even um, hurt Theo like he now he has a wound here and holds his arm also detail I wondered w what what happens there. it seems like his claw was hitting his his arm and the orc is 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 really like like look at this this punch of the claw like look at the table now here how the table um is here complete and then um if, if we go frame by frame this orc just cuts through the table with his punch so it was a mighty blow there and it really seems like these orcs are different from some of the orcs we know from lord of the from the peter jackson films this this guy alone is really scary already like he takes so so much damage and he has it seems to be really strong like when he throws this table flips um to 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 the door it's really really cool and Sio can't escape now and then, um, yeah, Bronwyn throws this flask at him and gives this nice effect here, which is pretty cool. Probably a practical effect, I would assume. And kind of burns or so. And then the orc also pulls off his mask. Or his helmet, because that is where the where she hid him. Like he 
the, the flask was exploding on the helmet. And now he looks like this. Like, like the orcs look really scary. Like, just to give you an idea, see where she hits him, like, here's also the thing here in this back. Yeah, it seems like they are deliberately digging the area and try to um, kidnap people to put into their camps, I assume. We know from the trailers that there are these prison camps. Uh, maybe they mine something there because there's always this yellow stuff at the walls, which maybe is sulfur or something. Very interesting. Yeah, he really looks like a transformed elf. Like a comp like This looks like a true mockery of an elf and still very powerful. They definitely go with the uh, mockery of the elf thing because it's hinted at in Lord of the Rings as well. And it's still the best version because otherwise it gets complicated. So, yeah. And interestingly, instead of... Like, he can't... He doesn't know who to attack. Instead of attacking um, Bronwyn, he um, he noticed that Theo is now moving and tried to, to climb up in the next room. Here we see um, Theo here down there. And then... Um, he goes up the ladder, which I find a bit strange, but I don't know. It's just an orc. Who knows what he thinks. And he uh, destroys the, the stairs. And Theo managed to get up, though. Kind of. And, yeah. I don't know where the where the blade comes from. But there at the ground, there seems to be like some kind of blade or so. Maybe it's it's hers or I don't know. Maybe of the, from the orc. Who knows? And then, um, yeah. She just... Uh, maybe it's like a tool from, from this place. Hard to tell. And she really rams it into, uh, into the orc's back. And yeah, the orc just turns around and pushes her to the wall. Like, she really crashes, crashes against the wall. You really notice the impact just from, well, he has this blade stuck in his body and Bronwyn holding the blade. She turns around and basically flings her over against the wall. Like, it's just really uh, a really strong orc, it seems. And then uh, I found this really funny because I've seen this also in horror films or something or in, in some other films, like the orc really tries to um, to break loose. But the um, yeah the, the blade is now connected or entangled with, with, with the with the stairs in the background. Well, it's hard to see but you probably know what I mean. Very interesting. And now, um, yeah, Theo tries to, to hang this guy in addition. Like, we have now um, this scene here, where he jumps down after, after pulling the rope around his neck and tries to hang him. I'd have noped out of there so fast. And somehow I've expected Theo to use the um, his black blade to make the orc kneel. I think he's not, maybe later, but I, if that is even possible. But um, I think he, it's not far. Uh, he's not far enough into this already. Like in into the whole blade. Like he just got the blade.
Yeah, yeah, he blocked up the, the door on purpose, like, he blocked the path. Definitely, so Seal could not escape. Very smart of the Orc, but he did some stuff, like, that was all his smartness. After that, it was gone. But yeah, he managed to... Um, Oh, that is interesting. I, I didn't notice this chat, but did you see this? Did you? I thought the orc would maybe use his claw to cut the rope above Theo, so he or hits him, so he falls down. But it turns out that this um, roll thing here, that the that the rope just um, basically uh, 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 that the rope basically snaps here. See this? Now the rope um, snaps at this thing here. Look at this. And that is why both of them fall down. I didn't notice this while seeing this in, in full motion. So, yeah, very interesting to see. Then Theo and the Orc fall, fall down and then um, it happens again. And the orc now slowly crawls to it. The orc looks really creepy. Yeah, he definitely looks very burned, like really terrifying. And Bronwyn then, then gets an, yet another blade and cuts off his head, which I won't show here. Maybe it was an axe and not a blade. I can't really see what what it is she's using. Maybe it's an axe to to cut wood. Hard to tell. Yeah, and then cut in the uh, yeah, literally cut, and then we are back at the tavern, and she presents the hat. Of the orc, which she cut up. I, I like how this woman um, puts her hand in front of her mouth. She's really shocked and so on. Some, so the extras did a pretty good job there to selling the scene. And yeah, now now everyone seems to be convinced that this is going on. He got hanged and stabbed and was still super strong. Yeah, exactly. Like he had the scissors in his back. He got um, this big other thing through, stuck in his body. He was, <laughs> he was, um, yeah, he was kind of hanged and then at the end he's still, like, his head needs to be cut off. Th only then he was dead. That's really impressive. But now people believe her. And, um, yeah, the people just um, move away from that. Then we cut to Galadriel again, yet again and... They are in this boat and in the storm now together. So we are now not here anymore, but again on the ocean, as we have showed previously. Like a lot of water stuff is going on. And yeah, then this in the storm, and I don't know. It seems like Galadriel um, basically tries to rope herself onto the raft so she gets not washed away. Maybe that is a good screenshot to demonstrate this. However, what happens then is, unfortunately, Galadriel gets hit by a li by, by lightning. <laughs> Uh, 
And Halbrand almost falls off the boat. We have this scene here. Looks pretty cool though. I have to admit these shots are really fantastic. Like it looks so great. Only the like the plot outline makes is, is still very strange for me. Yeah, and here we see um, the lightning um, appearing. Just have to find the next scene here. Galadriel is not hit directly, but kind like it, it hits a boat, and Galadriel is basically um, now falling, like because she is bound to. Um, She's kind of bound to the to the mast of this raft here. She um, yeah, is now slowly falling, uh, not slowly, fastly fall, uh, quickly falling into the water, and she goes off board. And um, yeah, um, Halbrand is now alone on the boat, but he has no sail left. And now we have these weird underwater scene like. We notice now that the that the rope, um, that that she's still on the rope and uh, is going downwards, and she's definitely making um yeah, some meters doing so. And now we have this metaphor thing again with the stone and the water. Where's up? Where's down? And now Galadriel is pulled down by the stone again. And she's like uh, maybe a bit unconscious or dizzy. Can't really free herself even though she would have a dagger for that. I don't fully understand, Chet, what this object here is. Is this basically the anchor of the raft? Is this, um, I don't know, to stabilize the mast where Galadriel was on or something? Like, wh why is it such a heavy object on this small raft? And you know what I mean? It it seems a bit strange. Uh, you're great, Janil. Always informative and interesting. Thank you. Much appreciated. Has anyone seen uh, Penn's Labyrinth? The mannerism of the orc reminded me of that movie. Yeah. I think I know what you mean. It doesn't exactly fit plot device. Yeah, probably a plot device. Uh, I think there's wind and there's wind. I think this is a wind, right? I think it's the same word as in German. No, it's not. Is it? Winch. Winder is a thing that could be the word.
Oh, that is interesting. Block and tackle. Oh, a winch, yes. Yeah, yeah, something like this. I will pronounce it correctly. I don't know what it is exactly. Don't ask me. Like, what is interesting, now that uh, we can see this a bit uh, easier, like, one p the, the winch is on her foot and the other stuff is around her. I thought I would have thought that all of the stuff is um, just one rope, if that makes sense, and she is connected to the rope, but it wouldn't make sense, right? Very, very weird thing here to him. Like, it seems a bit very constructed, if I'm honest. And Galadriel goes down. The strange thing is, though, maybe we don't just see the other cable, right? Quite possible. Yeah, that's the cable. Okay, nothing strange. I have to admit, just it, it's a pretty cool shot, not gonna lie. But it's also, like I said, it's. Um, it's a strange shot. Uh, not, uh, the shot is not strange, but the scene and the metaphor, the plot device for Halbrand rescuing her. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that is that is probably the biggest argument against this, that it is strange that Halbrand would um, go down the ocean. Here we see him now, climbing down the rope, rope behind Galadriel and um, move her. And yeah, he notices it. Like we have this shot where he sees um, in the lightning, he sees the dagger. Very interesting. Like some say it looks a bit like that he would recognize the dagger. It could also be um, also something like, oh, a dagger, but I can see. And then we have the film magic scene, like he pulls out the dagger and then we have a cut and then they are um, Maybe we can just play it here a little bit. Like basically he pulls out the dagger, cut, and we are back at the um, surface of the ocean and they um, get up in a moment. Very interesting. Let me see. Here it is. Galadriel is a super duper fight and she can't cut uh, her loose by herself. I think she is kind of dizzy or unconscious or so. That's why she couldn't free herself. She was just dizzy from getting hit, almost struck by lightning. <laughs> uh... Where did she put the dagger? That's a good question as well. I think... Oh, I currently don't know which which scene I have activated. Let me just see. I promise finding the scene will be a bit tricky because we have to... Uh, I'm, I'm an idiot, chat. What was I thinking doing this? 
Oh boy, we still have the stranger scene. I thought this would be like um, only the, the Durin scene is left. Yeah, you might be onto something. Um, I, I tried to find a scene where we see Galadriel, but we don't see her dagger here. Like she, she doesn't have a belt or anything um, to hold the dagger, which is kind of strange. I mean, you could argue later maybe she she um, has something like that, but I, I don't see anything that uh, would. Like in these scenes, the dagger is not is not seen. Also, there's this scene where they have this um, angry conversa conversation here. And you notice that Halbrand is taller than Galadriel, though Galadriel is like 1 meter 94 or something. <laughs> so how big is Halbrand? Kind of interesting thing, but we, we jump back to where we just were. So they're now both swimming um, back to the boat, uh, to the raft, and um, basically get on board, if that makes sense. And yeah, Galadriel, after a short nap underwater, gets on the boat first and uh, reaches out to Halbrand to um, get him on board again. So, yeah, it seems kind of interesting. The problem is, in the next, then we see them from above again, and then the next scene is back in Tir Harad. Uh, not in Tir Harad, in um, Rovanion. So where the Harfords are. Somewhere here. Very interesting. Here we see then the Harfords with the two lanterns, and now we come to the other stranger scene, which I totally forgot about. Like we still have so we have like a few scenes left to cover, and then I can call it a day and go to bed. We have six hours stream, that's really long. Like there, they find the stranger standing there, and looking at the stars, and um, he seems to have some connection to the stars, if that makes sense. Which is strange for Sauron, to be honest. Uh, my Govanen, welcome. Prison pocket, well. No, he just takes it. It's just a classic editing way to to do it. Like you just imp, you just show the process of doing it, and then you cut, and then you show the final result, and it always works. It's the magic of um, film.
Uh, the editing sucks bad um, in all the fast scenes. Yeah, maybe I don't. I don't know. I found it good enough to be honest, but you can definitely see this if you if um, like some definitely some details like this weird rope snap that I didn't even notice. Like, look at this this picture here. Like, he looks at them. He looks really like this. He doesn't look friendly at them. Like, I would be scared if somebody looks at me like that. Yeah, and now comes the Firefly stuff. And yeah, now we come to the Firefly, so... Um, But yeah, with this shot here, now this is how he looks at them with the fireflies. It doesn't look too friendly here in this scene uh, either. I should have let it um, go for a moment. And then he frees the, the fireflies like miraculously, um, like, like the, the, the lamp of Poppy starts to wiggle. It's only her, it's not both of them. And um, he seems to be then the fireflies are free and he seems to be drawn to the to the light, to the fire or so. It's very um interesting. And then he starts um whispering to the fireflies. And he says something. I can't understand what he um what what he's saying here. Would be uh, very curious if somebody had good information on this scene. But yeah, this makes him really look like Gandalf. Like I think, okay, it's Gandalf. He's talking to to animals again. But I'm not sure how much this is ref referenced in the books of how much this is just a Peter Jackson idea. Like that, he called the, this moss scene in um, in um, Fellowship of the Ring is definitely an invention. It's not in the books, but. Maybe he talks to, to a moss in The Hobbit? I'm not sure. Maybe they have a different lantern. We can look into that in a moment. Let me just check. Yeah, you are right. The lanterns are different. But also quite similar in a way. And here we have an interesting scene. The um, fireflies now are reflected in his eyes. And um, if you have seen the Lord of the Rings, um, the Fellowship of the Ring, there's also, like, they had this device for Galadriel that also made this reflection uh, into her eyes. Because they wanted to portray that she has seen the lights of um, uh, the, the trees of Valinor and the light of uh, Valinor and so on. So she's very special and she, they wanted to portray this in Peter Jackson's film. Let me see if I find it really fast. This shot here, you also see these reflection in her eyes. So here it is the uh, fireflies that are reflected in his eyes or the stars or whatever. But it's an uh, interesting idea. Yeah, Nori says we use fireflies. Why should it be Gandalf and not Radagast? Um, it could also be Radagast. It, just one of the Istari and Gandalf is the most popular Istari, I would say. Like, if I would put an Istari in my show, I would put Gandalf in my show. But it could, of course, be any um, of them.
And then the fireflies um, form like a star or a star constellation, maybe a letter or something. I don't know what it is. If somebody has a really good idea. Let me just um, try to find um, the other scene here. Uh, this is the beginning of the um, of all of this. Like the star constellation we had there. Does it look too similar to what we see here at the very end? I don't know. Could it be a rune? Maybe. I don't recognize it though. He has also one thing, I, I one firefly, I think. Yeah, exactly. They wanted to reflect the stars and so on in her eyes, but I, I assume like the stars are of course important, but also like because she has seen the, the light of the trees, like I that's why I think her eyes look so special and reflect the stars if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Uh, Ian McKellen is an impossible act to follow. But yeah, um, I, I wish I could tell you more about this, but looking at the, the only idea I had, it maybe it's a similar star constellation we see at the beginning. It is possible, but I could be wrong that they are somehow connected or so. But yeah, he seems to look at the stars now and um, then the fireflies are suddenly uh, all uh, basically dying. Why that is, though, is difficult to tell, I think. There's here another scene where we see one of the fireflies in her hands. Maybe I should have let it on screen for a moment. Uh, is a shape found uh, at the beginning uh, that Galadriel uh, wants to find? What is a shape found? Uh -huh. Maybe it's in Sardok's book. Yeah, that's also another source for the star constellation. You're right, the book of Sardok. Nuri knows. Yeah, that's a good point. The problem is now I have to find the book again. I can't remember where that was. <laughs> but I, tr I, I tried to find it really quick. Wasn't that in last episode with a book? Yeah, that was, we saw the books, there was one book seen before we saw the meteor, right? I know it's in the teaser that might help. I don't find the scene though. It might be really difficult to find. Yeah, this. Uh, I, I, did I find it by accident?
Come on, Sadok. Don't talk too much. Maybe it's on this page, because here we see some stars. Yeah, that is true. Nuri knows about the book. So yeah, maybe these stars here we see, I guess we get then when, when this develops further in next episode or so, maybe this book's ca book comes into play and then we can um, see it. Yeah, that might be the constellation, you are right. The problem is, you know what, um, we have to have to do this side by side. I have to find the scene again. Um, let me just try to find where we are again. I found it. Okay, I think I have this set up now to show it um, back and forth. Yeah, now it works. So, um, yeah, maybe it's, is it similar? Really hard to tell. There are some similarities between these two. And we don't have two stars here that are close, but we have two stars here. Maybe it's mirrored or something. Is that a Sauron symbol? Uh, I don't think so. I don't recognize it though as such. I mean, you could also say it's these two here, but no. Yeah, yeah, I, um, that is also, I, we discussed this in a previous trailer um, discussion, um, that it's really strange, as you say, that Tolkien wrote that the hobbits have no records of their past, but he has this weird book where everything is noted in. Maybe it's not his book, though. Maybe he found it and he can just read it. Still strange, I agree. What would happen if I would um, flip the, the, the image? It would not change anything, right? What is this symbol here? Like, I don't really see the, I don't know, if you see the, um, um, the, the similarity, maybe? I don't see it completely. I think maybe not, thanks for trying here, no problem. Can you please turn to the next page in the book? Uh, no. <laughs> I would say, I would love to say, yeah, no problem, but this the, the, there's another page where the where the two wolf symbols are. 
Let me just see if I can expand this a little bit. Yeah, maybe I can. Um, it looks like this. When we see these dots here, I would assume these are numbers or so. So this is a two, this is a four, and so on, a three, because they repeat all the time, but maybe they're also some distinct symbols. Oh well, yeah, this is, by the way, in case people wonder from the first episode, Maybe, um, though, there is a page that depicts it really well. Looks really old, yeah. It looks really ancient, I agree. Okay, so I would say uh, let's move on and get this uh, done. So that was definitely something I want to compare. Maybe the moon face, yeah, definitely a possibility. Yeah, and then we see Poppy and Nori again. And um, then we have cut to Durin, and then we have one time Galadriel, and then we are done. So they're coming down this stair here in Casa Doom, which is, of course, not here, but um, somewhere here. And yeah, first of all, and they talk about, and it seems like um, Durin the Third, like, like Durin the Fourth, Prince Durin the Fourth says that he can't know about it. Or that he trusts Elrond and he doesn't know about what they found. There are also, I think, some dwarves here in the background, which is interesting. And uh, then uh, his father comes down and says, um, yeah, all, all kinds of things. They discuss basically if, if they can trust the elf or not. If he c comes down because he maybe learned something about what they have found. And yeah, then... Finally, we discuss the chest here. They uh, get to this chest, and I said it seems like there are also other dwarfs. And yeah, those other dwarfs. Um, I don't know what they're doing there. They are not shown in the other shot. Why did the stranger cause the fireflies to die? I don't know. Like, I, I really don't know. I assume, like, at the beginning, we saw that he absorbed the fire from the meteor. And then it started burning again when he collapsed. So maybe he absorbs light and fire at times, if that makes sense. And also, like... He absorbed the, the fire, the light of the fireflies, and then they died. Maybe something like that. Really hard to tell. And then they open the... Uh, Uh, then they open the chest and something is glowing inside. 
it's um, really interesting to see that. It's only six and a half hours yet. And we are almost done and then we'll end the stream and go to bed finally. Oh, the other dwarves open it. And this is the last frame we have. That is interesting, isn't it? But I would say that it's pretty, I'm pretty sure it's the Misril. Not much debate on this in my opinion, but I'm not sure what does chat say. I could try making it um, a bit brighter. Doesn't really help. It's not a lot of rings, it's uh, rings of power. He didn't mean to, he's not in control of his powers. Possible. Is this before they made the special elf door? Yeah, you mean the uh, Durin, the doors of Durin, um, or Durin's doors? Whatever the whatever they were called in the books, um, yeah. Um, this this is before this door was made. Yeah, we know where Nori sings to find the constellation for the stranger. Exactly, I think it's in the book of Sadok. Uh, Odin says, um, the last part of the music in episode one isn't the strangers. Um, the choir part is actually the last part of Sauron. The added to the scene, um, which looks like the Eye of Sauron. Yeah. Like I said, my, my bet would also still be on some relation to, to Sauron. Maybe he is Sauron. Maybe, um, I don't know, Sauron and Gandalf share a body for whatever reason and they fight over control. I, I have no idea what the explanation is. It's really strange. But yeah, the there was in one of the trailers, maybe I can find it, like a... Uh, Durin talks about like the beginning of a new era. I, th I think I found it. Durin the Fourth. Like we have this scene, th this scene from one of the trailers. It's not glowing as much, to be honest, but I would assume it is this what we see in the box. And it seems like the the Kili Brimbor did not tell it. It it's that, and we have also on the other trailer this seen with the leaf falling down. And here you also see this these uh, I assume mithril vines. Is this vine? No. In German it's Ada. Um, I'm not sure. But you see the mithril here on the mountain and it also slightly has this slight glowing, so I would assume it's exactly that what we see. Yeah, yeah I'm also more leaned um, towards Sauron when it comes to the stranger, but as I said, it, we could be wrong here. Maybe it's a red herring, I, I don't know. I just find it strange that the these things die off really all of a sudden. Oh, I forgot one scene. It comes after the Durin scene, but yeah. 
I mean, it glows quite a bit. I would be surprised. Uh, uh, we we discussed the Silmaril theory that it could be one of the Silmaril that they found. The doors of Durin were had these Ithildin, as they are called. Um, they are, can only be seen with moonlight. One could assume they have to do with Mithril, though, but I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Durin the the uh, the third is worried that Elrond showed up because they found the Mithril, and um, so it must be a new discovery and want to keep it secret or so for the time being. Okay, it's, in German the word is Ada, which also means vain. So I'm not sure if, the, if Mithril veins would be the same. But yeah, okay. So it's the same name for it. Um, and somebody um, suggested earlier that it could be a Silmaril before um, we come to this. There is a theory, even though it's unrelated to this, when um, Thror, um, well, was it even Thror? No, it was one of, the, of his ancestors found the Arkenstone. And it's possible that um, in a very early version of um, Tolkien's writing process of The Hobbit, where some parts of the Hobbits were borrowed from the Silmarillion that Tolkien wrote from his Book of Lost Tales and so on. So from the very early version of his mythology, um, that he maybe borrowed um, the, uh, the the idea of a Silmaril as the Arkenstone. So it maybe there was a time in Tolkien's life where the Arkenstone was supposed to be a Silmaril. However, I would argue that, um, well, I would not argue that Tolkien distanced or developed this idea further and the Arkenstone became its own thing. So the Arkenstone is not a Silmaril, but it is, um, yeah, it, it, its own thing basically in the mythology. Just wanted to point out, there was a time where maybe the idea was when the role of the Silmarili were much, much smaller in Tolkien's universe, which there was a time where this was a case, where they became more and more important when while he worked further on this, that um, this is um, interesting. <laughs> yeah, some characters like Elrond is borrowed from it. There is a theory... Um, we find it in history of the Hobbit that um, maybe at some point Tolkien wanted to write the Hobbit into um, his mythology, like at a place in um, in um, in Beleriand, maybe definitely like then the Elven King could be like Thranduil, uh, not Thranduil, um, Thingol, for example. And he also lives in his halls um, and so on. So there are some, some similarities. Menegros then could be referenced. The the rivers there. You could definitely see some things. Like the Necromancer when um, Sauron was still called uh, Thu and so on. So you, yeah, you definitely see a lot of parallels there. They could be just Tolkien borrowed that from his other works. He writes this also in a letter when people ask um, why Elrond is in The Hobbit and so on. Um, the, the question is then, of course, when did this change? But um, Tolkien at some point said, yeah, I just borrowed those names. But maybe in a very early state, he had the idea of mind to, to write it into this already written or part, partially written mythology. Also, um, <laughs> Chris, get some sleep. Yeah, uh, very soon we have like I don't know. Is there much to say? All I want to say is just 
There is a reference for dwarves and the Silmarilli in some form. In the early days there were also there, there was in Auglamir, there was also a Silmaril in it, and the dwarves wanted to have it as an interesting version that Tolkien wrote. The Silmarillion version is though a bit changed. To, uh, Christopher Tolkien had to make some changes and he had not access to some of the texts from later. Maybe I would have preferred those. Though the basic idea of the text that Tolkien wrote is not that it's not too different from what Christopher Tolkien wrote. Very interesting. But it's a different topic. There was like a text um, found at some point in, or it reappeared at an auction. Very interesting. But let us not go into Silmarillion territory. Next scene is uh, we see Theo. I also should maybe switch the scenes and not get myself into trouble. And yeah, he looks at his sword. And um, yeah, he's wounded maybe from the fight, I think. And um, suddenly, like, the um, the sword seems to draw the blood out of his body into it, and then it kind of, let's call it, um, activates. Let me just switch the arrow for completeness sake, because that's not where we are anymore. We are now in uh, Tir Harad again. It seems like Bronwyn also convinced the people to go somewhere else where it's safe, maybe to the to this watchtower. And we could already figure this out from um, the, what's it called, um, trailers, that this might have been the case. And then, yeah, Theo managed to activate the sword, and we see this fire and smoke stuff um, appearing, and suddenly, I don't know, something happens, happening with the sword. It seems like the sword just um, reconstructs itself now out of smoke and, I don't know, some, some fire appears. Very interesting to see. It's basically an inversed Morgul blade. I already said this in another analysis. And it has a Sauron rune on it as well, which is uh, very, very interesting. And you also see the rune of Sauron um, that we have discussed there um, quite a bit. And it seems like um, Bronwyn is, is packing. Here you see the uh, the rune of Sauron here on the sword. It seems like Bronwyn is packing and they want to leave to this tower. And yeah, Theo is watching at his sword that he found. And yeah, that is, uh, in my opinion, um, really, really strange. It looks somewhat similar to the smoke that this weird priest wrist, um, uh, did and so on. Very strange. In from one of the trailers, Eminem, or Nas Girl, as we call her here often. And yeah, then Bronwyn basically calls Theo, and you see the people here in the background leaving the village to get away from the orcs and in safety. And we also see like a sword or something, like a weird thing on the cl on the clothes of um, or on the shoulder of um, Theo. Not sure if there's any meaning behind it, but maybe. It also looks kind of like a sword or something, right? Very interesting to see. And yeah, he blows out um, the candles and um, then he also leaves uh, the house. Yeah, does it go back to being smoky? Yeah, maybe. It, but it, as I said, it feels like maybe it becomes now bigger and bigger over time and still it's completely restored and then terrible things happen. However, now Bronwyn with, uh, and Theo leave their home and um, they just go to this watchtower, I assume, where the elves were stationed. And maybe um, Arondia is still there or not. Really hard to tell. I assume... Like, I don't know what exactly happens, to be honest. Arondia has to be able to come back at some point or get imprisoned. How this exactly works, I have no clue. And then 
Um, yeah, they, they basically wander off with these people and curious what happens next there in this region. Pretty nice shot though. And then we switch finally back to Galadriel. And this I think is the final shot. Uh, Halbrand and Galadriel are very exhausted. I like the detail of little like there seems to be salt on her um from the from the water on her um what is the English word for this body part again? Forehead. Yeah, I <laughs> found it. Where are all the sheep? Did they leave livestock behind? That's a good question, to be honest. Has the sort marked him with a symbol? I don't know. Maybe. But I don't. I think it would more mark it on the body, not on his cl uh, clothes. And yeah, then Galadriel wakes up first, of course. Kind of. They are yeah in in the water, and we see somebody found them. Here we see the salt again on her forehead and so on. I really like the the details here. It looks like she had a really rough time. And then we see like um, yeah a figure in the light and uh, sails, and I would assume these are Numenorean ships, because the Numenorean ships have these double sail design, so that is kind of fitting. And yeah, who this is we can't really recognize. Maybe it's Elendil, but his hair is too short for Elendil, I would say. So I, I assume it's somebody else, but I don't know who. Maybe it's Farazon, but he wouldn't. I'm not sure if Farazon is on the sea. Seven hours, not bad. Yeah, though I won't. I, I'm not pretending to make it complete the uh, the se uh, the the seven hours. I'm actually loving the show. Yeah, so far I'm also very positive about it. Some things I disliked, but um, a lot of things I liked, and that is um, <laughs> that is quite quite positive. But we have discussed this show now, show now for seven hours. I'm really really tired. I'm hungry. I really need something to drink, and. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is there a scene left? I don't think so. This is also, uh, I assume, relatively close to Numenor now. Who knows where exactly. But yeah, I think um, Galadriel then collapses again and then the we have the um, the credits. And that should be it from episode 2, right? In episode 3 we will see where, I assume Galadriel will be brought to Numinor and there she's put into prison, same as Halbrand, but she's probably freed first or something. I'm not sure. We will find out. Um, yeah, as I said, that is the last scene. Any speculation, chat, who this could be? Like, I would say the hair is not fitting for Halbrand Isildur. Uh, doesn't wear a cape on ship. He seems like more like a normal sailor in, in relationship. So I don't think it's him. Who else is left though? Oh, you got a trailer. There might be a trailer for next episode. Yeah. I think there was a new trailer uh, on, on Amazon Prime, right? I don't have it um, available here.
My bad, it's only sealed the audio. It's definitely possible. The hair would kind of fit, I think. But yeah, so I would say um, that was um, a lot of fun today. Um, we did a watch party. We watched the both episodes again. We did like a seven hour analysis of episode two alone. So yeah, a lot of content here um, for that. Yeah, I still have to make videos. So there's definitely um, that. So I maybe get to the screen here already. <laughs> Isido for the rescue. Where on earth did I put my end screen? There it is. Finally, okay. Yeah, one big issue is having uh, two durins. I agree on that. That's really. Uh, they said they had an explanation for that. I'm very curious what this explanation might be. But I'm not sold on two durins as well, to be honest. Even though I like the dwarven part quite a lot, but this is a detail I think it feels very unnecessary to me. I also hope that now that Galadriel finally arrives in Numinor, that she normalizes a little bit and um, stuff seem more smoothly and make more sense. Like I guess we have to just deal with how she gets to Numinor, which in my opinion is still very, very strange. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, sending Numin, uh, Elrond to Numinor makes, I guess, sense, but I assume they wanted him to be in Khazad-dûm, which also makes kind of sense, in my opinion. But Numinor would have worked for Elrond as well, I, I, would, have, I would suggest. But the problem is, where, did they, where, where should they put Galadriel instead? You could argue Galadriel went through Moria one time in the Unfinished Tales, for sure, but... Um, and it was not like she was, uh, like, I don't know. It, it's, it's really hard to describe how her relationship to the dwarves might have been in the second age. Probably not terrible, but... Um, I feel like um, Elrond has for sh seems to have, due to his past uh, or due to his appearance in The Hobbit, also have a very close relationship it seems of close is an it's maybe a bit too much but there seems to be to uh, Elrond knew the the dwarves a bit <laughs> thank you Sleep well yeah much appreciated for staying so long and watching um through all of this here with me through all the night that was um kind of exhausting so I'm really tired and hungry. Yeah, that's always like the question. I always don't know how to answer that. Like some people ask why um, cover the show and so on and so forth. Because it's fun. <laughs> it's just... 
there are other bad adaptions. Like I would also, I also talked about The Hobbit and The Hobbit is also not a great adaptation at times. So I don't know. And I don't care about um, the political stuff. That, that's It's as simple as that. So I, I can't believe that somebody un unironically reads Tolkien and, and I don't know, posts on every Tolkien Lord channel on YouTube in every comment section answers to every comment in the comment section that people should not watch the show. While Tolkien, um, I don't know, was always a person who promoted something like, I don't know, be friendly to other, be respectful. Like Tolkien did never write, go to other comment sections and call people names. That's not what he wrote. But people do exactly this. So it's in, a, in a same, the same way I could ask the same question. How can a person that is calls himself a true Tolkien fan be so incredibly impolite. That is also a strange thing. So it's oft sometimes very difficult to, um, to, to to find this out. Like I don't fully understand what the problem is with people. I, I get that people don't like the show and don't want to watch it, but then I, I think we, we are now, I don't know, we I've covered the show for, I don't know, weeks, two years or so. Why should I now stop when the show comes out just because some persons don't like it? Like, it makes no sense. I can totally, I'm, it's not like I'm praising the show completely. We have criticized like this particular plot part here quite a lot. Um, I don't fully understand why so many people get to all kinds of Tolkien channels and just complain about people watching the show and maybe having a good time and discussing it. Even if the show is absolutely terrible, like every published media needs some reception and can be discussed in a completely sane and polite manner, in my opinion. It's not a bad thing. Tolkien was not for censorship or people not reviewing his works. He might have not liked some of the reviews people wrote about his works, but um, he was not particularly against it. So why should I be against it? Like, it's just a very strange observation. Like, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't understand some of the people on the internet currently. Like, I respect people that say, mm, the show is not for me, I don't like it, I think it's terrible, I think it's boring, whatever. Yeah, totally fine. Especially like it when people also um, have like good reasons. Like if they explain, yeah, this plot, like I'm, for me, the staying true to what Tolkien wrote and like being very precise to the, to the, to the source material is very important for me. And um, the sh I can't basically um, ignore that the show takes so many liberties. And that is why I don't like the show. That's a completely fair argument in my opinion. But um it is just so incredibly strange that people like draw the weirdest excuses to just um, almost spam the the internet completely with with this. Like, yeah, okay, I, it's totally fine, and I don't like when people call out people who who criticize the show. Like, like if somebody says I'm disappointed, I didn't like that plot. Totally fine as long as this happens on a very polite and rational level like but people can I, th I think if if you dislike the show you can also say okay um may like you sh the show is not so bad that it's completely negative that nothing is good in the show like somebody wrote in my comment section i basically hate the show i don't like it but it has at least pretty images and yeah that is a comment where i say yeah that's true it's not completely terrible and maybe some people can't um, discuss with or don't like certain details, the plot, the story, the characters, whatever. But at l there's definitely also something positive about the show. Like, especially if you consider this could bring potentially new people into the Tolkien fandom. And if we are so unwelcoming to everybody um, and basically going through the internet on your, um, on some kind of, crusade if you want to call it like this and call everybody out who likes the show and watches it how do people feel like it feels like okay the Tolkien fandom is really a closed club and the doors are closed and nobody is welcome there that's a bit how it can um, come across to other people and that I find un very unfortunate so I would recommend that <laughs> like 
just accept that there's a show. It might not be for everyone. It ignores the law a lot, but it also does a few things right here and there. And that can be, um, my opinion, um, appreciated. And it is at least good enough that it deserves a critical reception. If it's positive or negative, doesn't matter too much, but it receives it, in my opinion, is a show that can be reviewed in some way, discussed in some way, and um, looked at in some way. And um, that is what we are doing here on this channel. And I always try to be very neutral and accept everybody independent of the opinion. But I don't like being um, discussing like literally every stream or half of my comments about why do you watch the show, um, Amazon Shill or whatever. It's just, it's just my honest opinion here that I was positively surprised by it. But yeah, <laughs> Gang Rider, good to see you, Chris. Good to see you also, Gang Rider. <laughs> but enough uh, rambling here. Yeah, exactly. Like you can, it's also not like, um, I know Amazon is a weird company and they do a lot of stupid stuff. I even have like the inner conflict of using like affiliate links. I'm currently still very conflicted if I should use this. It would be potentially make sense business wise, but on the other side, am I pr not promoting Amazon with this? and? Like, like I said, it, it's it's weird, especially when I want to review the show. Complicated topic, but yeah, I would say we um <laughs> well, something if um the thing is objectively um I know better, so that nobody has a give a right to enjoy it. Yeah, but the the show is definitely not objectively bad. That's definitely that is that is simply um a statement I can't get behind. It's subjectively positive uh, good or subjectively bad, but it's not objectively bad. I guess it's not even objectively good in a way, but it's compet competently made and you can see the work that some people put into this for sure. <laughs> exactly like I, it doesn't like it's not like that people can't post critique or say I didn't like it but I don't I find it strange that people like that's not the first time I've read it now a million times by now um, that people go to channels and post like literally like when you post more comments in my comment sections than I Chris the philosophers games do you do something wrong like Especially if every post is the same. Don't watch it. Check the, I don't know, channel X or Y. I, I feel like, what, what am I supposed to do there? That's almost like spamming my comment section. Like, if you have a lot to say and there's an interesting discussion, that's something different. But some people just are really, really triggered by this show, it seems. That is strange to me. Yeah, exactly. And I think how what Tolkien-esque means and how good something is, is a very subjective matter. Like I'm not a professional filmmaker or writer for film, so it, it's hard to judge. Of course, as, as a consumer, you of course notice when like a script com does not work completely, but um, it's um, some people like some some writing styles, some dislike it and so on. Yeah, of course, I agree. It's, it's, it would be awesome to get like the perfect show that is very close to what Tolkien wrote, like the perfect show. But yeah, it's probably never going to happen that we get it like this. And for some people, not even the praised Peter Jackson films were perfect in any way or they li dislike them or they took too many liberties already. 
And that's totally fine to criticize it for that, but sometimes I really can't get my head around um, some people on the internet. I would prefer to discuss law details ma far more than weird politics or stuff like that. That is definitely... Um, seriously, um, uh, <laughs> I have not the time to devote my extra energy to spend on complaining about a show. Yeah. But that's basically um, my my stance on this. Yes, I would say. Considering how the Tolkien fandom um, takes statements like these, they didn't phrase this very diplomatically wise there, I have to admit as well. I guess they wanted basically to express that um, they wanted to do something Tolkien never did. Tolkien never did a novel of the Second Age, and I think he never planned to do a novel of the Second Age. And that's basically what they mean with the book he never wrote. But it can... Um, yeah, definitely people can can tr can be triggered by a statement like this. I can totally see that. Yeah, the, the 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 quote spamming that was also interesting. But okay, I would say um, we had um, like enough rambling uh, today already. Um, I need to go to bed now, really. I'm really at the end of my um, focus and concentration path here. I just... Um, let me just think, how can we do this? Maybe we could do... Did I, did I save this? No, last time I didn't save, right? Well, that was a terrible mistake then. <laughs> Mark Sheets, I good, good morning, good morning. Now, it was already a heated debate from the start, like before the showrunners even gave a single interview, like oh, the comments at times, really unfun. I really, really like my uh, comment section, but it's it's kind of annoying when every time you um, you make content or so that uh, people just, I don't know, get really angry at stuff. What was the last video I composed, Chad? Did I place it here? I did.
Okay, chat. I'm, I'm just preparing the um, the ending of the stream in case you wonder what is he doing. Why is he so silent? Um, there are multiple, um, not multiple, but a few things I definitely uh, still need to do. So what what is next on this channel? So I will t maybe if I watch it again, maybe I make another watch party on Twitch if people are interested in watching it again. I don't know. Probably not, but who knows. But uh, the VOD of that won't be on my main channel, then on the archive channel instead. Um, that is a thing. Then I will work on like in a more condensed version of what we just did today for the two episodes. Um, in the couple of days, it will be tough to make, I have to admit. Maybe I do like a short spoiler-free review. I'm not sure um, what I will be able to manage to to pump out in the next coming days. I need to organize something. So next week I potentially also have um, an interesting stream with maybe some other talking creators. No promises yet because I have to see how busy all the others are. I have to find like a, a good date, maybe shortly before the next episode comes out. So um, that is definitely a thing. Then is uh, what else did I forget? Like, yeah, that's basically um, it for the time uh, being with this content. That was a lot of content. I hope you enjoy this. I can, of course, uh, always recommend watching like the Who is Galadriel video. Let me see if my uh, bot command works. Consolidate a, a few days. Yeah. So for people who haven't seen it, that is the first part of the Who's Galadriel video. There will be more parts. We're still in the first age, so that's basically no spoilers for the show. Great work that I uh, will watch from the start later. Awesome. 8 p.m. for me. For me, it's 9 p.m. already. Uh, AM, I mean. Mm, I like the law videos, they are great. Thank you, much, much appreciated. Uh, your, analysis, your analysis is the best um, I've found so far, even uh, if I belong to the uh, disappointed ones. Uh, much appreciated. Like I said, you don't have to, um, of course, like it. Uh, how about uh, the plant roundtable? That's what I mean. I the, the roundtable stuff with maybe some where we come together, I assume here on this channel, and I discuss with some of the other creators um, the show or impressions. Maybe I don't. I can't give you a date yet because it's not organized. But let's if if it if I manage to organize it in the next week, it will it will be either Thursday. Or maybe Wednesday. One of those two. Hard to tell. Because Friday the episode comes out again. But yeah. Oh, I, I also forgot what I actually what I also wanted to do in the background. Like my, my brain is now also again slow. You have to excuse this for a moment. I would want to show still the credits and give shout outs to all the um uh to all the people here. Um that that did like a, a channel membership or so. I haven't checked my um my other uh, thing here. Uh, the problem is always I need to change my um, my credits for the streams and for the videos because the second tier of the membership is only is for credits in the streams and the um, 
the 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 last tier is for um, credits. Uh, the the last tier is for credits in videos, so it's always different. Should not have done this, but I couldn't come up with a better better incentive or it was a better perk for for the channel memberships. Let me just check. Did I forget anybody? And then, uh, yeah, doing doing credits on, on uh, just just editing them live always difficult. There might be some people um, I missed. Sorry for that. Shout out to you anyway. Um, let me just fire up the credits here at the very end. That I also um, fulfilled what was promised. And um, yeah. Thank you very much for watching, people. I hope um, you uh, uh, enjoyed the, the stream, had a good time here. Uh, thanks for the entire walk so far. It's always great to watch. Awesome. Really much appreciated. Okay, my credits are stuck. Maybe I have to fire them up again. Or I have to pre-render them really fast. Now we get technical difficulties late. Maybe it works now. I hope it does. Uh, wait, uh, Rotan, I heard the episodes will releasing three hours after the premiere time. Is this right? What do you, what episodes? The Rings of Power episodes are already out on Amazon. The next episode should be Friday at 6 a.m. in the morning German time, like Central European time. Amazing streams. Thank you for your hard work. Yeah, much. It was a lot of fun. I'm still surprised that people watch this um, all the time. But um, yeah, shout outs to you. Thank you for the uh, memberships and for um, the comments, the likes, the, um, the, the su subscribes from people maybe. Really uh, much appreciated. I hope you had a good time here. And I would say, yeah, as I said, if you liked the video, as always, watching this as a VOD in the far future, still press the like button, leave a comment, um, subscribe, recommend me to other people who might watch the show or are at least interested in this um, topic of Tolkien or the books. And I wish you a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you for um, being there. What's the time count um, of the two streams? This is now 7 hours 23 with minus 20 minutes, I think. So 7 hours. The other stream is only 4 hours or so. So 11 hours. And then I streamed <laughs> like a bunch before that as well. Don't ask me anymore. 5 hours was the other stream for episode 1. So yeah, le let's not calculate it. It's just too much. Who is supposed to watch all of this? Nobody, right? But yeah, <laughs> I should now stop the stream. My, my mind is really going slow. So thank you for watching. See you people next time. I go to bed. I think I deserved my rest today. Um, see you next time and have a good day.